loan you'll be going you'll be going with a lot of people and then it it shows that you need to be protected because anyone at all can harm you so you should change that mindset because the people need the no, you, somehow the youth. he's right no, somehow he's, he's not no it's not no you are not in his constitution wait 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 wait. So it's not even about that mm -hmm. you you people are you all are agreeing, but me, I said I disagree. It's that my is point of view. view. That, that is his point of yes. view. Yes. Right. And, 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 of course, what many man can say, and yes, I'm not saying say, oh, that's why I said 90%. But this thing, this thing, anyway, <laughs> are you sure when you get to the top, you're not going to do the same thing? It will be the first. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 Mimi say I'm a mate where I'm a mate. Do you know how politics politics in their family home? Because if I don't work, I will not eat mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I have to work. It's a politics in their family home. Would you also agree to the fact that they are setting good examples or bad examples for us? It depends on the one ruling in each of us, like our constituents. <laughs> no, from the general point of view. Um, from my view, like. Some I see the leading president, like he's doing what's more. They are doing their best. They are doing their best. Yes, because it's not easy ruling a lot of people. Even being in the house, you realize that you are just four, and then you are the elder sibling, and then you have to control just four children, and you see it's a lot of stress. Yeah. So he's doing his all possible best to make sure that the country is in shape. Are the leaders setting good examples for you? Currently, they are not. They are not. Yes. Why? Especially the president. Okay. Because we have a a presidential jet right uh -huh. but when he travels he hires a different one which is causing the financial loss to, with his own money for real no go on <laughs> which he is causing the financial loss to the country i don't see him doing anything actually okay so we you don't, don't think they are no they are not setting any good example all right dixon me the one you share mommy they are not doing anything mm -hmm. Do you think there are, there's opportunities for the youth to voice out their concerns? There is, but even if you say it doesn't get anywhere. Why did you find yourself in any situation? This one, where will it get to? This interview. Where would it get to? Yeah, yeah that's what I'm... Everywhere. So if they don't watch it, or they don't know about your... They will still get to know. So that's what I would say. A lot of the, the youth are getting chance to speak. But Okay. 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 But computer people. sometimes I my opportunity. national television, my opportunity maybe change some things. Portals be a bit change. Maybe I can maybe I can be so there. It's no me who say it's fifty fifty. I think yes, because um this we have uh, um the youth have uh, um, many ways to speak. We have TikTok, Instagram. You don't know who we, who will be watching. You will get the opportunity to be on TikTok and then we use it for anything. If you go to China, you realize that the government permit them to post a specific thing on their TikTok account. But then you come to Ghana and then they don't post anything productive on TikTok. Just I know you are supposed to be laughing, but then sometimes when you get such an opportunity like this, you make sure that you voice out what is happening in your constituency. Maybe you don't know the um, someone who will pick up your video. coordinator for the citizens coalition so that's why i'll be making the opening remarks um so i'm introducing myself and then i'll carry on and make remarks right so i'll be both mc and uh, <laughs> everything for for today 
So let me let me welcome all of you. Uh, let me uh, uh, recognize uh, my good friend, uh, Doctor uh, Edward. Uh, um, Edward, I'm <laughs> uh, who is representing the UNDP uh, resident rep. Um, let me also welcome members of the Citizens Coalition who are here, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CDD and uh, to today's program. We are talking about building a culture of accountability, safeguarding democracy, and promoting inclusive development. This is uh, an RTD on public officers' responsiveness to accountability, transparency, and compliance to rule of law. I think everybody agrees that we are at a crossroads. And sometimes when we use that word, uh, it doesn't really resonate. But I'm sure as you are preparing for the Christmas and you go to the market and uh, when you buy one or two things and you see the receipt, uh, then you remember that we are indeed at a crossroads. Right? So the, this is a very, very difficult time, I think, for most Ghanaians. Uh, both the current uh, economic crisis, um, uh, the fact that we are um, in an IMF program, the 17th, uh, should call for some very serious introspection. Um, and in our efforts to react to this current predicament, uh, we, we seem to still be doing business as usual. I mean, one would think that a crisis normally sort of helps you change behavior. Uh, it scares you a little bit and maybe you begin to think differently about how you should approach things. But since we even announced that uh, we were going to the IMF and uh, debt exchange and food inflation at 50-something uh, percent, uh, nothing seemed to really change. So that is a cause for worry because then there's only one outcome, that we are not going to succeed in um, securing fiscal consolidation and economic recovery. I mean, sometimes I actually think that even the state itself in trying to react or respond to this problem uh, is fighting with itself. <laughs> Almost uh, self-inflicted uh, uh, problems, right? So, We've come together uh, as a citizen coalition when we did in last, uh, we are in 2023 now, last year, in the middle of last year. Um, we, we, we set ourselves the task of trying to reinvigorate this culture of accountability because we know that there is no democracy that can work if there's no accountability and we were seeing the accountability processes, you know, best collapsing uh, in front of us. And that made it very difficult uh, for us to get the benefits and the dividends of, of, of democracy. So when we came together as civil societies working um, on, on different issues, but trying to forge uh, a coalition uh, that can push for a restoration of, of democratic accountability, um, one of the things we had to confront was the economic crisis. And right from the beginning, we made it clear that we were confident that the IMF uh, was not going to be a silver bullet. It was not going to solve all our problems. So whatever we were going to do, we needed to plant the seeds for economic recovery right at the beginning. And that meant that there was a lot of behavior that we have to change. And we repeated that at every opportunity, even when we had the opportunity to meet the president during the discussions, we made it very clear that we do need to see in the budgets that were presented in 2023, budgets subsequently, that there was a clear plan for economic recovery, even as we were trying to aim for short-term fiscal consolidation. Um, our experts that we have brought here today will tell us whether we are doing well, we're making progress, uh, we're overcoming those challenges. Um, now that we've had a first review of the IMF program, um, 
and for civil society uh, leaders that are here, for students that are here, I'd like to acknowledge our, uh, our students chapter from the University of Ghana who are here. I think they just got in and registered. I'm glad that they are here because I remember last year, was it this year? Uh, I'm not quite sure. It was this year. When the IMF program uh, was uh, signed off and we went to campus and we were asking the students, had they had an opportunity, any platform to discuss the IMF program? Uh, they said no. So nobody was, was talking about you know, the IMF, which was going to define how we manage our economy uh, and our development, at least for the medium term. And I thought that was problematic, you know, for uh, an academic institution, you know. And for students who, because of unemployment and, you know, uh, youth uh, challenges, should understand the context within which they have to manage their futures. So we, we did promise them that any opportunity we got to talk about the economy, we would try and get them involved. Uh, we couldn't find the biggest place, we couldn't afford the biggest places, but next time we have to take it to, you know, to campus uh, and, and, and give more education. So let me thank uh, our CSO experts who have always made them, themselves available uh, to educators, um, you know, to, to be here again to give us uh, a status update of where we are. I think we have to stay the course if, if we are to ensure that we get the benefits of this IMF program um, and, and really chart the pathway to economic recovery. So let me end there, uh, welcome you, and then uh, we'll proceed and uh, uh, ask uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Prechum, uh, to also make his remarks. And then after that, uh, my co-coordinator for Citizen Coalition, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim Mohamed, who is also the EGP Economic Governance Program uh, coordinator, to also make a few remarks and then we'll proceed. So, Dr. Prechun first. Thank you, Dr. Sante. Dr. Kuja Sante, convener of Citizens Coalition and your co conveners Professor Bokpin, Dr. Tiwe Champon, Dr. Alina Chia, expert from civil society, development partners gathered here, our young folks who are interested in issues of accountability because your future actually depends on this. Media, present, all protocols observed. It is a great pleasure to be here with you today and to welcome you to this roundtable discussion on public officers' responsiveness to accountability, transparency, and compliance. with the principles of the rule of law. I actually bring you very warm greetings from the leadership of the UNDP in Ghana. The, rep the resident representative would have loved to be here. Unfortunately, she's still in the post-COP activities far away in Dubai. Today's gathering is a testament to our collective commitment to fostering accountability and accountable governance within our country, Ghana. Let me commend, or let me commence by commending Citizens Coalition for convening its significant gathering, providing us with the opportunity to reflect on the challenges and opportunities related to public officers' responsiveness to accountability, transparency, and compliance. This is a crucial part of our efforts to promote accountable governance. Ghana's governance and democratic credentials are touted as one of the best in Africa. Indeed, Ghana has made impressive progress on many governance indicators, ranking seventh 
out of the 54 on the Mo Ibrahim index. Among many other indexes, I've seen quite a number of them. They present this very nice picture of Ghana doing very well. But of course, if you're comparing Ghana with others who are not moving at all, then you think your Ghana is doing very well. Despite these achievements, challenges such as vertical and horizontal distrust among government institutions, ineffective, inclusive governance, and undermined accountability systems persists. And I really like the choice of these words because these describe clearly the situation we have here. Ineffective, inclusive governance and undermined accountability systems. Transparency is crucial for effective governance and accountability. Democracy seems, unfortunately, to be undermined by the fact that the public's ability to engage in the fight against corruption is severely constrained by the fear of retaliation. Some studies we've seen shows that seven in 10 Africans believe that ordinary citizens risk retaliation or to other negative consequences if they report corruption to authorities, while only one in four believe that they can speak up without fear. And this has direct implications for democracy, where citizens do not believe they can speak freely or fear of the consequence of speaking, there is limited space or scope for active action. And I'm happy that this coalition is willing to take things forward, irrespective of whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Ghana has implemented various measures to improve accountability and transparency, including the public finance management systems, the establishment of the Office of Special Prosecutor to investigate and prosecute corruption cases, the implementation of the Public Procurement Act to ensure transparency and accountability in public procurement processes, and the introduction of the Whistleblowers Act to protect individuals who report corruption and other wrongdoings. Indeed, the Public Office Holders Bill to us is a pivotal initiative aligned with the overarching goal of ensuring fiscal discipline and contributing to the economic recovery of the nation. The legislative initiative aimed at combating corruption among public office holders seeks to address the issue of public office holders having unexplained wealth and other forms of corruption in the country. I share the coalition's concern about the prolonged suspension of this bill in the cabinet, underscoring the necessity for collective efforts to bring about its passage. And these and many others are some of the things that we expect that this coalition will champion, move things forward. The UNDP Ghana Country Program document recognizes the need to collaborate with national audit institutions and key actors as well as other UN agencies to promote transparency, accountability, and cost-effectiveness in public financial management and control of illicit flow of arms. UNDP has and will continue to support effective collaboration among local authorities, civil society, and communities at large, as well as developing partners to establish dialogue spaces for deepening democratic discourse to promote inclusive participation, increase leadership among women and youth, and also demand accountability as we are seeing today. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me close by assuring you of UNDP's continued commitment to supporting and working with all stakeholders to promote transparency and accountability in public finance management and promoting compliance with the principles of rule of law, which are key to delivering the development ordinary Ghanaians deserve. In conclusion, I wish you very uh, good deliberations and let us all contribute our quota in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prechum, who is the governor's advisor at the UNDP. Uh, let me invite uh, Abdulkarim Mohamed, uh, Economic Governance Program Coordinator, also co-coordinator for Citizen Coalition. Thank you very much, Kajo. Taking the benefits of speaking last is to 
able to take advantage of existing protocols. So um, I would like to stand on uh, existing protocols and uh, thank every one of you for honoring our invitation to be here with us um, this afternoon. Um, as Kojo mentioned, I mean, um, when we came to the point in our national economic life when we realized we were not going to be able to do it ourselves, um, we had to go in an ambulance virtually uh, to see the doctor for a rescue. Unfortunately, this is the 17th time that we are having to do this. Now, the main focus of the program that we have subscribed to with the IMF is for macroeconomic stability to put our macroeconomy in, in order because um, the truth, I mean, the best way to describe it is that we have messed it up. But as um, citizens, citizens coalition together, working together with the economic governance platform, uh, we took it upon ourselves that we would not want the lives and livelihoods of Ghanaians to be sacrificed on the altar of macroeconomic stability. So we made a very strong case that whatever program that government subscribes to must have in it some social protection measures. So for me, as, as we go into the discussions today, um, that is something I'm looking forward to. Is the program delivering on those commitments? Um, I mean, the good thing that we can say is that if you take the program that we sign up to, a very um, considerable amount of the propositions that were put forward by civil society were actually accepted and incorporated into the program in the form of, um, um, what do you call it, um, um, uh, the reforms, the structural reforms, and some of the benchmarks that government is expected to achieve in order for us to graduate. I mean, along the course of the three-year program. So first, are those social protection measures, have they kicked in and are we seeing the benefit? The other one that I'm also looking at is that when the Minister of Finance read the budget, I believe you all, those of you who took time to listen, he said that we had turned the corner. Have we indeed turned the corner? And um, what does it really mean? To you and I, if we have indeed turned the corner, right? So that is something that we also need to uh, have some appreciation of and see where we are or where things stand today. Then he also made a very big pronouncement, which we have been grappling with till, till, till now. That by the end, I mean, with this budget, by the end of 2024, the, the total GDP of Ghana would be about 1 trillion Ghana cities. Do you know how many zero, zeros are in a trillion? <laughs> okay, all right. So the, the economists, the experts are here with us. One is uh, online and two of them are here. These are very renowned, very knowledgeable people who are going to help us. So um, mine is very simple. Sit back, relax, and uh, have your pen and paper with you because um, they are going to take a deep dive with us into the details. And I hope uh, we are going to have a very productive day. Uh, once again, thank you for honoring the invitation. And we look forward to a very productive engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Um, I think uh, before we, we move on, I needed to just do this very quickly. Um, a few months ago, we lost um, an important member of the Citizen Coalition, um, one who helped us shape our manifesto when we came together, uh, Mr. Uh, Lawyer Kotwampao. Uh, and I want us to stand up and observe uh, a minute's silence, um, commit him to prayer, Commit him to the Lord. Thank 
Thank you. May his soul rest uh, in perfect peace. On uh, on the thirteenth of uh, December, actually on Wednesday, right? I keep getting my my days. Uh, maybe it's because of his end of year. Um, we will be commemorating his life. It's a celebration of life at the National Theatre. It's free. Everybody's invited um, to just recognize, you know, his contribution to humanity. Um, um, and to recognize, you know, really what what he stood for. Um, you know, he was the champion of the downtrodden of anybody and really the pursuit of justice for anybody, whether color, you know, income status in life, it didn't matter. But he was a real advocate, if if you put it that way. So you are all invited to National Theatre, 6 p.m. And as I said, it's free. So please join us. Um, now we are going into the uh, the main discussion why our our experts are here. We will change the order a little bit. Um, we wanted to present some small experiment that we are doing, trying to track some of the PFM commitments that government have made. Remember that this is government of Ghana program that is supported by IMF. It's not an IMF program supported by government. So every commitment that government makes, it's government that says, I will do this. And the IMF is saying, okay, we'll help you. We'll offer some technical support. We'll offer some small money, this and that. So we have to hold our government accountable for what they say that they want to do that will restore fiscal consolidation, right? So we will, we'll talk about that uh, later. But I want to now bring uh, Dr. Tio Champong because... You know, he, you can't pay him uh, even by the minute. So uh, he needs to leave. Um, uh, he will leave in the middle of our discussion. So I want him to start the presentation. And then he will be followed by Professor Bob Green and then Dr. Ali Anachia uh, to talk about uh, taxation. So, Tio, if you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good to be here. I, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, just double checking. Could you that everybody can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, brilliant. Thank, thank you. Um, again, as as sometimes I wish I wish I were in the room, but the nature of the work is such that we are always running around somewhere um, in, in, in the world. And it's good to be in um, great company. Um, in fact, most of the things that I'll be talking about, I'm sure uh, Prof. Bokbin and um, uh, Dr. Ali Nachia, both very good friends of mine would um, throw a, a bit more light uh, on, on, on that. Um, but I'll try to speak just for about maybe 15 or so minutes. Um, and raise a couple of um, points in relation to uh, the, the IMF program. Um, some of them are indicated when we met earlier in the year um, on a similar platform organized by the CDD, but we have a couple more data points now. So um, my, my talk or conversation this afternoon for me really is beyond just the the courses, which now many of us are aware about. I mean, uh, what do we look out for when it comes to uh, economic, you know, recovery first, and then to an extent, you know, structural transformation, which is something that we have been chasing since, you know, uh, in Chromex time, but importantly, you can go back to the um, mid 80s with the structural adjustment programs and we still seem not to have found our way around it. Um, could you made a very important point when he started with that if you're, or if you have a crisis and you go to a doctor and the doctor diagnoses you with one ailment or the other, 
you have to change certain actions. So it could be that the food or the foods that you used to enjoy and eat, either you have to stop eating them, the banku or the fufu, or eat smaller portions or eat a bit earlier. Um, and it looks as though for us uh, as a country historically, when we have this crisis that is meant to force a behavioral change, once we start seeing little progress, then we go back to eating, in my view, sometimes even bigger balls of, of kinky and banku, and that ends up compounding issues for, for us. So that's just a bit by the way. Uh, but yes, I just want to quickly talk about some of the, the things here. I mean, the, the recent history, many of us are aware, and I've shown this chat on, on the screen um, several times. Um, but you can actually see in the last um, 12 or 10 years, we have actually been to the IMF already three times, uh, the 15th program, the 16th program, and now the 17th uh, program. Um, and uh, all of that has been occasioned um, before uh, the, going into the program with relatively lower periods of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of growth. Um, and then um, you can also see uh, subsequently, um, let me swap my screen. I think there's an issue. Maybe this is this should be better. Um, and then you can also see um, in that period for me, what I think are two key data points that highlights a number of the of the challenges that you know we've been going through uh, as as a country. So again, I, I completed this table just to show you a couple of the key economic indicators going back to 2010. But just to pick on two of them, the, the current account balance, uh, which basically reflects your um, external trade terms, and then also your um, the deficit. And you can see consistently going all the way back to 2010 that it's all, it's all been um, in a negative territory. So in, in very simple words, the, the shock uh, absorbers or the shocks that we needed to build in the economy is not really uh, being, being there. Um, and therefore, when you have all these you know, crisis or external issues, then you're going to struggle uh, for, for that. Um, we've talked a lot also about if you look at the deficit or the, the financing, on the revenue side that we most of our revenues is going into three items, uh, compensation, grants and revenues and interest payment. These are all factors or facts that we, we know. So I'm not going to belabor the point. But then there's also the other factor, and I've shown this again before, that the, there's a big um, political spending cycle that tends to drive a number of these perverse outcomes that we see. So if you track the year-on-year -year change in our revenue versus the year-on-year -year change in our expenditure, you can see that even in election year, so in years that your revenue goes up a little bit, you're getting bigger change. So um, for those of But my professors are also the Prof. Bokvin and uh, Ali are there, so I'm sure they will even do a better justice to it. Um, but yes, the, 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 the big point really is that we have been living beyond our means as, as a country. Um, and you would hear a lot this technical term, uh, pro-cyclicality of fiscal policy. In simple terms, you know, uh, when your revenues go up, your expenditure goes up, and sometimes even more expenditure more than your revenue and you have very little left in terms of savings which would be able to allow you to withstand any shocks that you know uh, may come 
uh, your, your way. So here, what the red line is showing you in very simple terms is that um, I want to look or take data from our fiscal outturns table, which is published by the Ministry of Finance, and uh, take the same thing on our revenue and, and um, grants and the expenditure, and then just did the difference between successive years to look at the rate of change. And what is really interesting um, over 12 years worth of data is this little peaks that you see on your screen. Um, and coincidentally, they happen um, around election years where you have a big jump in your expense um, versus the previous year, so the year before the election. And then you have to go on this self-correcting sort of path only for us to repeat that cycle um, all over again. And this is you know, one of the big elephants in the room here that um, we've got to for address. And I'll come to it again when we're talking about solutions and what to look out for um, next year. So hopefully this, this gives us a bit of context. But the point, again, that many of us know or may be aware of is that the country has been literally broke for a while now to the point that it's debt distressed and it's hard to go through a number of um, uh, processes or interventions to try and correct uh, that, uh, especially on um, reaching out to the IMF and then a certain um, adjustment that needs to be, to be done. So as of the end of this year, we were supposed to have gotten in total uh, about $4.2 billion in terms of ex um, extra financing uh, from both the IMF and the restructuring of our external debt. As we speak currently, we've only gotten the $600 million from the IMF. And if you add or assume that we're going to get these other $600 million from the, the second tranche, subject to the um, official uh, debt restructuring commencement beginning, then what that means is that already by the end of this year, we would have even missed our target on the, um, uh, the financing that we're supposed to receive because we have not um, done the full external right, debt restructuring. So if you take 600 million from the IMF over the course of this year, and you divide that by 4.2 um, billion, um, you're gonna get, I think, what, just around or less than 30, 25% of what you're supposed to be coming through for this year alone. So already you can begin to see that, you know, you, we've got some, some problems that we'd have to probably address going into 2024. And my view is that it's even going to be further challenging or, or very difficult uh, to be able to get the full um, uh, measure of what we're looking to get from the uh, external uh, debt you know, uh, restructuring, um, restructuring in, in some respect. Some positive is really okay what we've done on the domestic debt uh, exchange program. However uncomfortable it was, at least on the broader macroeconomic objective side of things, uh, the government does claim some successes um, in terms of reducing, for example, the, the coupon and extending maturity um, on, on some of the debt instrument. But overall, it's given uh, them uh, about uh, 61 billion Ghana cities worth of savings or around 7% um, of, of GDP. Uh, this is from the, the latest budget that 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 was uh, that was read, but then of course the trade-off with with all of that is the serious impact that that has had on the financial sector, on credit availability and um, access to financing in in general uh, for both businesses and also for the private sector. So overall, what we've seen is uh, the recent announcement that was made. Um, on the conclusion of the first review of the IMF program, 
um, and the expectation that uh, the second tranche of the $600 million is going to uh, come in. And again, those of us in civil society had actually won, you know, a little bit uh, in, in September and uh, a few months uh, after that the government has to be a bit measured and careful in terms of how it communicates some of these, you know, expectations to the market to the point that now as we speak, the second tranche is still or still hasn't come in. Um, and people are beginning to worry whether or not, you know, Ghana would even get that because again, it's all subject to making progress on the uh, restructuring of the external debt, not the private bit, but the um, official, you know, um, uh, creditor, uh, creditor bit. Um, I want to pivot a little bit uh, on to talk about uh, the whole approach to, to inflation and inflation targeting, and then I'll talk about the structural reforms bit and, and what to look out for, and hopefully we can have some uh, further discussion on that. Um, again, I decided to take a more historical view of things. So what you see on your screen is really three data points, headline inflation month on month, the policy rate, and then the um, treasury bill uh, rate, which uh, is the 182 day. Um, just uh, two points to really highlight here, uh, that you see inflation and then the big spike um, up to um, the uh, earlier part of, of, or the latter part of last year, and then things beginning to sort of correct uh, a little bit. But importantly, inflation is still above both the policy rate as well as the interest you know, uh, rate. In other words, if you're investing even in, in government securities uh, um, now, you're still getting a negative return um, on, your, on, your, on your investment uh, that in, the, in, that, in that regard. But it also does have you know, major um, consequences for uh, government borrowing, and it has um, impact to the extent that you're not able to restructure uh, or you have a delay on the restructuring of the um, external debt. Government will still have to be forced to resort to borrowing on the, on the domestic market uh, to meet its financial uh, obligations. And the markets have already begun to, uh, to, to punish the, the government somewhat. So I talked about the fact that these new bonds were listed at around 9%. If you look at the trading or the interest rate levels on the secondary market now, they're actually around 18%, which is close to the rate at which some of them were trading even before the commencement of the domestic debt um, exchange uh, program. Um, so that's just a little context. So what are the prospects? Or what should we be doing medium term um, and, and all of that? And Kojo was very right in saying that the IMF program now is a government program supported by uh, the IMF. What you see on your screen basically is my attempt to narrow down the PCPEC program in, into its core component. So at the very top of this pyramid, which is the foremost priority, is this whole idea of restoring fiscal and debt sustainability. And for that, you know, it's what you do with, uh, with cuts uh, to expenditure um, and some of the front loading that we, we should be uh, expecting and then restructuring of the domestic and then the external debt. Once you attain that, sort of sustainability, then the number of other deeper points or deeper structural reforms that need to complement that um, as part of that process. So things to do with um, structural reforms, what you do to support industry, how you um, stabilize inflation and the exchange rate. And this is really more the remit of monetary policy um, as well as broader financial sector stability. And then the bit that for me is probably even more important, the last two bits at the bottom of this pyramid, entrepreneurship, jobs growth or jobs creation, 
and how we protect the vulnerable and the poor are, 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 are really fundamental component uh, in terms of the, the good agenda uh, going forward. But at least for now, the emphasis has been on the, the top um, item uh, on, on, this, on, this, on this pyramid. Um, and in terms of supporting the reform efforts going forward, a number of things uh, have been proposed tax reforms, governance reforms, SOE reforms, PFM reforms, uh, you name it. I want to just highlight a few of them and talk about the things that I think we should, as civil society, be monitoring uh, going forward. And I'm sure my my other colleagues there would also be speaking to some of these in, in a bit more in a bit more detail. Um, within within the two bottom anchors that I showed on this on this pyramid here about job growth and entrepreneurship and kind of social protection, I think that there are three sort of key things really that our emphasis ought to be on. Um, businesses are struggling. You hear Guta, you hear, you hear the importers, exporters. Everybody has had a rough time uh, in the last few years to the point that if you even look at the data on our export competitiveness, we begin, we've actually lost a lot of ground to some of our uh, neighbors, including you know, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so uh, it comes down to how we improve that compared that how you, for example, uh, to drive the areas in the economy where Ghana relatively has a comparative advantage. So things like automotives that we've started with, things like um, textiles and garments, uh, there's, there's other areas like non-traditional non exports that um, if we're serious about we can generate two, three times more revenue than even what we're getting as our entitlement from gold and from oil production, you know, combined. There's also the bit about the whole uh, digital economy and digitalization. And in the last few weeks, of course, many of us have been involved in debates around 24-hour economy and what is possible, but clearly, we, we've got a base uh, to be able to improve and build up upon that, not as an end in itself, but as a means of creating jobs, about formalizing you know, uh, the, the, the economy. And then there's some other things about you know, climate resilience and flows to, to support that. Let me finish with what I think are some of the things that for us in civil society, we should pay attention to, especially um, next year being uh, an election year. And I wanna talk about five um, things that we, we probably ought to put or place a lot of emphasis on collectively. Number one is uh, the progress that we make on our external uh, debt restructuring. Uh, like I indicated, the second tranche of the IMF loan is actually been pending uh, because we've not been able to complete the official, um, you know, uh, creditor restructuring agreement um, in 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 principle the MOU and related matters. Um, again, if we make some progress on the, it may give the 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 state or the government some little room in terms of um, uh, fiscal consolidation and ultimately some of those monies finding their way um, into supporting the productive or the real sector of the economy. I think second one on the exchange rates and inflation front, I think that yes, on inflation and exchange rate, we're gonna have some relative stability. But again, um, it's about ensuring and pushing importantly for the amendment to the Bank of Ghana Act, which has been proposed in the IMF program um, to ensure that, you know, we reduce the effective dominance of um, the, the Treasury, the, 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 the Ministry of Finance, in terms of the overall uh, 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 
policy agenda in, in the country. The IMF uses the word, quote unquote, you know, a fiscal dominance. Um, in, in very simple terms, the Bank of Ghana has lot control over its, you know, monetary policy making over the last couple of years. And it's a, it's a question of pushing for the amendment to the Bank of Ghana Act that would allow them more, uh, more autonomy and more independence. I think also, third one, for us as civil society, we should be able to monitor the spending patterns. I showed the chart earlier of the election year excesses. Um, the good thing also I, is that uh, on the Ministry of Finance's website, that's a, a data release section where every quarter they provide, you know, uh, flows of both expenditure um, and um, revenue. I think we have a, an opportunity there for me uh, or for us to perhaps think about maybe some sort of dashboard or place where we can track, right, some of these spending patterns and flows. Where is the money going into? Which areas are they going into? Because especially in election years, you see a lot of, uh, you know, frivolous expenditure things taking place, a lot of dodgy contracts that, that will be signed, sold, sourced, uh, et cetera. And this is another area that collectively at CSOs we should pay attention to. The last two points that I want to highlight comes back to the party manifestos itself. And this is one of the root cause things that I think uh, we, we again must interrogate. And here is the, the warning about um, big unfund, uh, um, uh, unfunded promises that the parties tend to make. And I say this because there's very, very little you know, room uh, for any government coming uh, in 2025 to execute any big promise that they're going to make, because we're still going to be under you know, IMF program. And if this whole external debt restructuring, even further delays, then the, the idea of uh, collectively $15 billion of fiscal room may just not manifest. And so we have to take the parties on, interrogate their manifestos and question them and inform and educate the public uh, on you know, the reasonableness or otherwise of some of the promises that they're, they're making. And then related to that, I think really it's a question of engagement on the party side, but also on the civil society side to ensure that, you know, if once the opportunity presents itself, we can input into these party manifestos and policy interventions in a way that allows us to address the bottom bit of the pyramid that I showed, address issues of poverty, and inequality, which has been worsening and rising, and then also how you ensure that Ghana becomes the best place for doing business, at least in, in, in West Africa. But you know, these are more medium to long-term interventions, but I, I think that there's ample room for us collectively on the CSO side to start pushing on some of these things uh, going forward into into the uh into 2024 and the part of the reason this is my last slide uh really is what you see uh, on your slide here you see that our two parties are very big often on big jargons and big slogans uh and when it comes to implementation and the details around that often that is lacking and sometimes you even wonder who is copying even from who um, this is a, 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 a deck or slide that I got from Professor Babwatin uh, in one of the earlier um, Iman, uh, sorry, uh, CDD sections a few years ago. And you begin to see, you know, uh, almost the like for like change and swap of words um, of our two parties. In a sense, you can argue that, well, at least they understand what needs to be done in terms of jobs and transformation oh, is, is in the details. And then the last, last one is, yeah, the, the issue of governance 
really, really fundamental, right? Uh, and it's at the core of that. Uh, the IMF did um, issue a, a statement recently about them concluding some governance diagnostic and that the report should be out sometime early next year. Again, I think there's an opportunity here. So we probably can add it as a, as a set point about us interrogating this governance document and importantly, sort of the milestones when it comes to implementation going forward. And one of the footnote points there being the, the conduct of the Public Officers Act or bill, uh, I think we should, as civil society, be pushing um, for a passage of that bill, at least before the, the end of the tenor uh, of, of this uh, administration and a new one possibly comes in um, in 2024. So with that said and done, I will pause here and uh, hand over to uh, to Kujo uh, and the team. Uh, but I'm very sure that my two other colleagues, uh, Prof and Dr. Ali Nachia, would explain or expatiate on some of these issues even a bit more. Thank you. I think uh, one, one easy, easy headline, headline is that, that if, if, if <laughs> We don't, we don't tie, tie the hands, hands of, of our, our government, government next, next year. year. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And they go and spend, spend more, more. Uh, with all our, our piling up, up uh, of debt. Uh, we'll, we'll find, find some, some very, very difficult, difficult times, times for ourselves. For ourselves. So, so that's, that's one, one task. task. <laughs> Whichever way we can. <laughs> we can hold them and <laughs> restrain them from just going on a spending spree. I think we have to do that. Uh, our other two uh, panelists and speakers, you know, they are also lecturers, so they also have students waiting for them, and uh, we are we are delaying them. So I will ask Prof. Buffin to come in. Um, uh, let's see, yes, let's see how how you do, and then uh, uh, Dr. Alina Chia can also join. I think once you're done, then I can, because if you if you finish and you leave me, I can't answer the question. So. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, all existing protocols observed. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here and to talk about Ghana's economy. I, I find it a bit uncomfortable to talk about the economy in the afternoon. Uh, but forgive me. Uh, Dr. Tio, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, I don't know whether you copied my slide or I copied yours. <laughs> Uh, so, please, my presentation will hinge largely also on what you have said. Uh, so, thank you very much. So, um, can you project my slide for me? Um, I have a very simple task, um, a, a little macroeconomic update. Uh, have we turned the corner? Uh, whose corner has been turned? Probably there are several corners in town. And we, we need to count how many of them have been turned and all of that. Um, whilst I wait for that, it's interesting. Um, we have been to the IMF. We have been to the IMF, and we are saying that we have been there 17 times. Then on the IMF website, they are saying that, okay, yeah, um, I was saying that we have been to the IMF. We made a course. And per our counting, we have been there 17 times. And then the IMF that has been receiving us is telling us that we have been there 18 times. <laughs> so we call it the 17th IMF supported program, but on the IMF website, they are counting the number of programs as 18. Okay, so. Uh, depending on where you belong, you can say 17 or 18. My suspicion is that when COVID came, when COVID came and we went for that 1 billion rapid credit facility, uh, they considered that to be a program and therefore they are looking at it as 18. But we that we have been sick and visiting the hospital, we are saying that we have been there 17 times, but that is what it is. Uh, let's put this within context so you have, a, you have an idea the journey ahead of us. What Ghana is looking for under the IMF supported program is macroeconomic stability. That is not an end in itself. The dominant view in economics is that to have 
greater economic transformation and inclusive growth, inclusive productivity growth, you first need to have macroeconomic stability. So macroeconomic stability is a means to an end. So what we are struggling to achieve now is not an end. What we are struggling to achieve now is what? It's a means. And let me submit to you that since independence, what we have been struggling at is the means. No one has arrived. We have not. So, and we, to have economic transformation and inclusive productivity growth, you need a sustained macroeconomic stability for no less than 15 years. Continuous. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. And you need to look at it because that is a that is a point, depending on also institutional reforms and the rest of that's a point where macro level stability begins to translate to micro, and then you see efficiency passing through to private sector level and household level. But because we've not been able to guarantee macroeconomic stability for a long time, we have relative macroeconomic stability, then either shocks from external environment or from the domestic and elections, we derail out, and then we need to start all over again. The understanding is that to restore macroeconomic stability will come at a cost, it's usually at a cost. And then let's also look at it this way. One year or six months is too short to assess how well the IMF supported program is doing. I hope that's okay. Um, when, you, when you aid, I'm saying aid because we've seen some development beyond us, but when you aid economic disruptions, you can't just bottom up suddenly. Do you get a point? So it's not like you can easily just jumpstart your economy as though, <laughs> no. And that is why countries are very careful in how they manage their economies so that the disruptions, when crises come, how you slide is a bit moderate. But how Ghana did is a bit some way, and therefore the cost of repairing is going to be very costly, right? So let's bear that in mind so that we have a fair idea that let's have a long-term view to this recovery. It's not something that is just going to be immediate and for which and that will benefit every Ghanaian. And, and before I continue, let me put it this way, that where we find ourselves, it will take death to separate some people from the challenges. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I'll demonstrate that. You know, let's say it the way it is. I hope you understand that. So... Okay, all right, okay, so you, you just have to look at, you know, when you get the data and you do, your, you do the modeling and you look at where Ghana is and what it will take to get to where we want to get to, you, you, you will feel for this country. And, I, and let me say, if Ghana were to be a company, any serious CEO who is looking to take over the company from 2025 will look into the situation and say, I don't want to spoil my CV. I am moving on. So look at the number of people who put themselves forward to manage the economy. The last election, you see that number? So if you are sitting here thinking that the political party is coming to change your life drastically, please forget about it. I hope that is okay. And, and, and before I start my main presentation, you should just know, no political party can be in opposition for more than eight years. They would have pulled much more than the country itself. So when they come to power, it's about recovery, and it's about building reserves for the next phase. So you are not in the picture. You are not the consideration. We only use the poor as a care of. You understand that for our hidden agenda and the rest of them. So let's look at our country honestly and see what we can do. So oh, this thing is not responding. I hope it's not behaving like the economy itself. <laughs> OK, so we'll look at the macroeconomic update. So um, if you were doing this presentation in the early 60s, and maybe, uh, yeah, to the early 70s, there would have been no difference between Ghana and Singapore. There would have been no difference between Ghana and Malaysia. 
per GDP capita terms were almost at the same level. In 1960-61, Ghana's GDP per capita was higher than that of South Korea, the newly industrialized nation, right? So you can see fast forward a couple of decades down the line, do you see where Ghana is still? Is Ghana is the blue line for the avoidance of doubt. We are here. And then you can see where Malaysia and Singapore are. So the gap in 2022 seems almost impossible to what? To close. Remember Ghana and Malaysia got independence from the same UK the same year. Okay? And this is where they are and this is where we are. The difference is not because the one is more naturally endowed in terms of resources and the rest of them. Just look at it. Data from 2020, Ghana spent more than $22 million importing palm oil. Malaysia lent about palm oil from us. Right? Yes. You heard me. Ajungo and the rest. Okay. The, the narrative that has been sold to you and I over the years is that our underdevelopment is, is because we are not generating enough revenue. That is not true. Don't accept that anymore. So let's go to the next slide. And you see, so in terms of tax to GDP ratio, substantially you can see Malaysia, Singapore. At some point in time, our tax to GDP ratio was higher than Malaysia. Some point in time more than Singapore. The reason you see ours sliding down at some point has to do with the rebasing of the economy. Right? So once you rebase, the denominator enlarges. When you do the scaling, it drops your outcome variable, which is your tax to GDP ratio. That's how you see it there. But what we needed to ask, what are those emerging areas in that GDP calculation and the tax generation potential of those ones? So the reason you see our tax to GDP ratio as low is that over the years, Ghana has not been growing a taxable economy. I hope you understand that. So if you are not growing a taxable economy and you are using tax to GDP as a measure, you are always going to get a result that will not be consistent because it's not every aspect of GDP and its redistribution that is taxable. Okay, so going forward, part of the recovery, what we need to do, I'm sure my good boss is here, Dr. Lee Nachan, he is a tax expert. He was born with taxation. Some That is huge. When you go out there, the roads are not there. They are in our stomach. It's corruption. It's corruption. We do road construction. You go there the next six months, it's gone. Okay? It's corruption. The kickback and the kick front has to be explained through low quality. And, and we are undermining the competitiveness of this country. 
through corruption. So individuals through corrupt means are becoming richer than the country itself. Let's move on to the next one, okay. So look at COVID that affected every country. Okay, even our COVID performance was slightly better. You can see 0.5% in 2020 when a lot of countries were recording negative growth, right? But look at how countries bounce back right after COVID. I'm picking Côte d'Ivoire. You can see 2021, 7.5, 7%, 6.7, 6.2. You can lead the, see the forecast for 2024, right? Look at Kenya, and then yeah, look at South Africa and the rest of them. So you can see, and the reason you see that our ability to recover post-COVID is not so much of the virus. It has more to do with how we monetize the 2020 election. So Ghana's fiscal deficit in 2020 was one of a kind. So when you have a shock, the impact is pervasive across the world, you see marginality. And in that marginality, you begin to see those who were well measured in their response and those who were not. And that is what is showing here. So across our regional peers and our structural peers, you can see that we, haven't, we have not recovered at the same, at a faster rate compared to others. If you look at it from the monetary point of view, this data is from Bank of Ghana, right? So you can look at Ghana, Ghana's policy rate is the highest, right? Is the highest, okay? You can't tell me you have turned the corner when your policy rate is still 30%. What corner have you turned? You understand that? We, we, have, we can't say we have turned the corner when you are still borrowing close to 30%. We can't say we have turned the corner when the Ghana reference rate is 32%. So if the, the, the base at which any of us can borrow is 32%, that's already too high, right? So, there's, so whilst we talk about it, it, it what the message we can get is that there's a lot ahead of us to do to recover inclusively and, and make the recovery much more broad-based. Um, so look at how the Ghana stock exchange has been behaving since 2000. 2011, right? It's very difficult to have stability for long. So you see the way the, the, the Ghana stock just mirrors the economy. It goes up and then what? Comes down. That looks like a child who is learning how to write. This is an organized performance of a country. Okay. So if you, if you invest on the stock exchange and your wealth keeps dangling like this, this morning Mr. Kwan Pieni was talking about it, right? And the rest of it is very difficult to, to take a long position in the market. And if you're an investor and you see this, you will not learn long. You are likely to learn short so that you can benefit from repricing. Okay, so we need stability for long so that people can take long-term what? Positions. And that is where job creation can come from, right? And, and bear in mind, nobody, no entrepreneur goes into business to create jobs. No, that's not their, their goal. Nobody loves you enough to have, to have you on their payroll. No. Businesses, entrepreneurs go into business to create value. It's when they see the need to create more value, then they hand over appointment letters to, 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 to labor. Otherwise, yes. in fact, there's a good story in the Bible. The scripture says that there were some people who followed Christ. Then one day they went fishing. And then whilst they went fishing, they, they, they roamed throughout the sea the night and got nothing. As far as they got nothing, they did not signal to the labor market. Then when they met the new CEO of the new company called it Salvation, and he told them the right thing to do, the Bible says that when they did, they got so much fish that they couldn't what? Pull it. Then what did they do? They now signal to the labor market. That is how businesses behave. Create the enabling environment. When they see they need to expand, you, you don't need to advise a business to operate 24 hours. I hope you understand that. They know how to do it. I hope that's okay. If there's a need for them to ask workers to come at midnight, they don't need a president to tell them. They know, they understand the business model. Let's create an enabling environment. Let's put the private sector at the forefront of our development outcome. And politicians should not be afraid. If indigenous private sector of Ghana becomes rich and powerful, we should not be afraid. And because, are, look, since independence, the average Ghanaian politician 
is scared of a powerful domestic private sector because of the role money plays in politics. They want both. They want the power. They want to be in control of the businesses as well. But we can't have the two in the same house. No, the separation has to be well managed so that we can give that enabling environment to the private sector without finding who are the, what are the identities of the businesses. And that is why I don't like the import restriction bill. You understand that it's, it's, it's a bit backward, right? We can't be talking about this in 2023. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's move on to the, oh, this thing is slowing me down. Okay, so have we turned the corner? Has the corner been turned? So look at retail sales. This data from Bank of Ghana ending July. Of course, when it's updated, we see how it is. You can see that retail sales has dipped a bit. Of course, domestic, domestic VAT collection has improved. But then look at cement sales. It's one way of judging whether the economy is expanding. It's recovery is doing well, okay, especially in the construction sector. Right? So when you see demand for cement picking up and the rest of them. But what do you see here? You see it's sliding, right? So if they said they have turned the corner, unless people are now building without cement and iron rungs and the rest of them, we, we, we need to find out what people are using to build that, right? So you can see that, yes, because we need the construction sector, the real estate sector, to actually pick up because a lot of us could actually get employment in those areas, right? So again, we are not doing quite well in that area. Can we move on to the next one? Okay, so industrial consumption of uh, electricity has aged up a bit. You can also see port activity, right? Our, our economy is largely import dependent. So if you see the performance at the port level, really, you can see the volatility, right? And all of that hasn't picked up significantly. All of this have also contributed to why the city is a bit stable. I hope that is okay because the economy itself is more or less on, yeah. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, so if the private sector is the engine of growth, then we are interested in mapping uh, lending to the private sector. You can see the latest data from Bank of Ghana, lending to private sector has dipped by more than 20%, right? So for businesses to expand, they will need input both finance input costs, fiscal input costs, labor input costs, and the rest of them. So you can see that that, again, has dipped. A good way to judge whether the economy is doing well and whether it's recovering well is to also look at the size of graphic. Is that okay? Apart from Mondays. Okay. So you, you monitor it consistently and see the way graphic, the size of graphic behaves. So Monday, you see that it's a bit like, I hope you understand that, after that, the economy starts what? This way. Because if the economy is doing well in recovery, you will see businesses placing what? Adverts in the papers, especially in graphic. So unless there are other means now. So and in fact, if you see the size of graphic on Friday, you will feel for this country. <laughs> okay. You will feel for this country. Right. So so there are other ways of judging whether the economy has been turned. I hope that's okay. So and, 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 and it should be broad-based, right? That's what is important. So we need this to pick up significantly. Of course, towards the end of the year, we expect that it will go up a bit. But it's not at the level where we can say that recovery has actually what, or we have turned the corner. Of course, as an academic, we recognize the relative stability that we have what, we have gained, and we appreciate that we need to build on that. But we have not turned the corner, right? So there's a lot that we have to do. It reminds me of a colleague who visited from uh, Switzerland, and then she was telling me that in, the, in her country they were complaining and all of that. So I asked her, what was the issue? She said inflation, uh, food inflation had gone up. And I asked her, what was this? She was talking about 9%, 11%. And I said, this is why people are crying. At that time, food inflation in Ghana was almost 60%. And, and she was asking, how are you people complaining? I said, we were born into inflation. <laughs> okay, All our life, we have never known low inflation. So we don't know how it is. Okay, so these countries, they've been in low inflation for so long. So even if it each up slightly, then they are comp something that we would thank God. And, <laughs> and you understand that? So, so marginality exists, right? So as we are here, some people are also in some other part of the world. Inflation is low. I mean, the, so let, let's move on to the next one. So that, um, all right, so recovery. We are, we are reco look at the structure of the economy, right? 
We started with agriculture as a country. I made this presentation the other time. This is also what we call the gorgeous back economy, okay, which was essentially to turn us into producers of raw materials to feed growing industries where outside. After 66 or so years of independence, we are still operating that structure. Nothing is preached more and practiced less like changing the structure of Ghana's economy. And up to now, we have not. Right? So, and while you see agriculture sliding, but of course, as we move along the economic transformation path, we expect that labor will shift from pure agriculture to agribusiness, agri process, industry, and then service. But in the case of Ghana, we skip industry. This is what we call Ghana's missing middle. Is that okay? So, and job creation would actually come from the, that medicine middle. So, we skip industry and move straight to service. But Ghana is not known for service. Our economy is not known for service. You now, you see the way we've been serving each other. I hope you understand. We are not known for serving. And also, if the economy shows like this, it, sometimes it tells you that the economy is mature, but it's not an, a matured world, economy and the rest of them. The reason industry is not zero is because of mining hydrocarbon production. Pure manufacturing really hasn't been well, doing well. And this service you see here is not quality service. It's driven by wholesale and retail, buying and selling. This is all that is springing up all around. Do you see shops, malls, and the rest of them? Now, once your industry is not doing well, it means that you are not producing those goods. So where is it coming from? You are importing. And you know, it's very simple in economics. As you keep importing, you're actually exporting jobs to the countries where you are importing from, and, and in reverse, importing their unemployment into your world. Into your country. It's very simple. If you even test books that our children read in the primary school, they are important. When they finish school, they have to go there and go and work over there. You understand that? So we are still recovering with this structure. Okay, we need a leader who will take who will do something fundamental about this structure. You know, one of the reasons why I vote I don't know whether it's okay to disclose that here. The, one of the reasons why I voted for Nana in 2016, okay, it's too late to withdraw my vote. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Was, was the message they gave us. He spoke passionately about the gorgeous back economy. Okay, look, let me tell you something. There's so much we know that if we will be honest enough to put the common interest forward, we will not be here. We will not be here. Okay, the textbook IMF is using, we've read it. Okay, so, so what is it? We are making it look like we are naturally incapable. I hope you understand that. Of, of, I don't know how to put it, but you see, it's greed. It's greed. You know, when greed comes into any modeling, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, the outcome is nyama. Those of you who don't understand that, I was speaking in tongues. I hope you understand that. <laughs> the outcome is some way. It's greed. We don't love each other. We actually don't wish each other well. I'm not sure it's our preoccupation that it will be well with fellow one another. I hope you understand that. Don't. We drive in our V8, we see the people begging by the street, don't we? We roll, we tint our glasses. We don't care. We don't care. Some have eaten nine times. Three square meal a day is nine. Okay? Three squared, mathematically, is what? It's nine. Okay? Every major meal, starter, main, dessert. Breakfast alone, you've done three. Lunch, starter, main, dessert. You've done another three, that's six. Dinner, starter, main, dessert, three, nine. Somebody hasn't eaten the whole day. Have we, have we stopped becoming human beings? So what is, what is the result? We've seen unemployment going up. As we speak right now, per Ghana Statistical Service data, 1.4 million persons in Ghana are currently successfully unemployed. Unemployed. It doesn't matter whether they did employment in the university or majored in job creation. It should be more concerned about 13.4% of Ghana's economically active population is out of work. This should concern you and I. The forecast from the UN and the World Bank is that our population by 2040 will reach 45 million. And 58% of that population will be less than 30 years. And the World Bank is telling us that between now and 2040, Ghana needs to create 10 million decent jobs. I'm not scaring you. This data. So this is what should engage our attention. So that whatever we do today, we put things in perspective. 
that the next generation, in the next 10 years, in the next 15 years, more of Ghanaians will be entering the labor market. They would have gone through free senior high school, quantity-wise, low quality, I hope you understand that, and they will be entering the labor market for jobs that probably exist in the textbook. <laughs> How do we... So I'm looking at the recovery Ghana is talking about must respond to these dynamics. So it's not just any kind of growth we are looking at right now. Colleagues, we are looking at job-rich growth. We are looking at growth that comes along with what? Job creation. We are looking at growth that is driven by the labor-intensive subsectors of the economy. We need to create jobs for our people. In fact, that is the only way the economy, we can grow a taxable economy. You know, like we say it in the economy, there are two people who eat. The first group are the ones who ask the price before they order. We need less of those people. Maybe a good number of us, that's where we are. They are the ones who go to the watch it joint and ask, watch it, we are the Not in a in a bottom. I hope you understand that. Okay, so, because the point is that he wants to be sure. Because what is in his pocket for, you know, then sometimes you are not like, so they start from 10 cities. Say, Sir, I'm not talking from experience, okay, but... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Observation. As a researcher, you observe, okay, of course, I left that market no long ago. <laughs> okay. So then they say, oh, it's 10 cities. Say, okay, give me 10 cities. Said, uh, how about the fish? They say, oh, eight cities. So, the tinu susa. Okay. And then, so in the other step, yeah, the tinu put there, so okay, give me shit I hope you understand that. And then, it's, it's, it's sorted. That guy buys the food. There is no vat on it, are you aware? The, the, so, it doesn't impact our revenue envelope. Then the second group, and that is where you belong. We need more of that. They are the ones who sit down and they are saved. They bring a menu that looks like a, a political science long essay. I hope you understand that. And then you go to say, oh, tell me, what do you have? What do you have? And then give me starter. Give me the main and then the dessert. And then they bring the receipt. They say, is that all? I hope you understand that. Now I'm talking from experience. <laughs> okay, so, no, no, please, this, this is just academic talk. So that GRA will not follow me tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, so, all right. So you see that the second group, when they bring their receipt, you will see get fun. I hope you understand that. Two people have eaten wachi. You see get fun in one of them. You see COVID-19 health levy. You will see national health insurance or levy. The, those, the second group who ate at a cleaner place are paying sanitation levy. And the first group who ate in front of the gutter There is no sanitation level. I hope you understand. So that is how you, we grow the economy. And that is how you grow a taxable what, economy until it is well with the people. You have not recovered. Okay? When we are talking about progress at the national level today, we are talking about progress that must reflect the five Ps. It must be about people. The recovery must be about what? About people. It must be about the planet. It has to preserve our planet what? Earth. So if you say Ghana has recovered, and I go to my community in the village, I should be able to drink from the water that once gave me life. I hope you understand that. You and I, since you came to Accra, you know some people, since they came to unless they die before they go back to the village. Let's go back to our village and see what is happening there. The water bodies where once we caught fish and the rest, I hope you understand that. Go and see what is happening. How do you describe recovery in the context of this? We are undermining our sustainability gradually and intentionally. And the state is majoring on the minor. The state is presiding over the destruction of our water bodies, our forests, and the rest of them. And later turn around and come and tax me 100 Ghana cities for emission, environmental, whatever. That's majoring on the minor. If the state cares enough about the environment, go and deal with the Galamse. Leave my 100 Ghana cities in my pocket. Why are we, why are we, why are we taking advantage of the vulnerable? This is all that we are doing. This is evil. So even those who said they are working, you see them in traffic, they are in vulnerable employment. Vulnerable employment is around 68 point something percent. It's high among females. 
compared to males. Actually, what we have done is that we are seeing more females assessing tertiary education and entering the labor market, but the economy is not expanding along those lines where we can what, absorb them. And the data now is even showing that the females are becoming more intelligent now than the males. The good thing is that we were not part of that sample size. <laughs> Okay, we can skip this also, right? So inflation, as I said, has come down. So it's a good news. It was 54.1% December 2022, almost galloping inflation. When we've done well, now it's 32. what? 35.2%. This, by world average, is still very high. I hope you understand. But this is my interest. Food inflation is around 44%. Do you see that? Food inflation is around 44%. Now, when food inflation is this high, the impact is more on households because in Ghana, data suggests that between 42 to 44% of household expenditure in Ghana is on food. Okay, so when food inflation is that high, it tells you the impact is what is going to be that heavy. But my focus is not that it has come down, but see whether it's broadening. Look at regional differences. Food inflation. Have you seen Eastern Region? Food inflation is 65.3 percent. Eastern Region, just here. So, can you just imagine that you live in an economy where, from October last year to October this year, food inflation has gone up by 65 percent? My time is up. Uh, well, I don't know what I'll go and do with the rest of the slides. Maybe. Okay, so just if I'll, I'll conclude very soon. Okay, so look at the regional differences. But you should be concerned when you see this from Eastern Region, right? Some time ago, it used to be Ghana's food basket region and the rest of them, right? So depending on where you find yourself right now and where you eat, the price is different. Okay, of course, inflation varies from one region to the other, and inflation again varies from individual to individual. So as we are all sitting here, we carry different inflation rate because your inflation rate may be different from mine because your inflation is a reflection of your consumption basket. Okay, so uh, my time is almost up. The rest of the slides, when I go, I'll sort it out with my wife. Um, can we go to the next one? Okay, so I can skip this. Okay, so what we are going through in economics is what we call debt-induced microeconomic instability, right? So when you have that situation, it's difficult to bring down inflation and a weak fiscal regime and rising public debt. And that's why we have struggled over the years. Go to the IMF, they say we will not go. Go to the IMF, they say we will not go. It was almost like multiple choice. Choose the one that you like, right? The difference between Ghana and Kenya right after COVID was that Kenya was proactive in going to the IMF because we all exited COVID with almost the same fundamentals. But Kenya proactively went to the IMF. At the time, we were also advising our government to go. We chose ego and political interest over the common good. And our delay, when we finally applied... 1st July 2022, and the IMF did their debt sustainability analysis. Ghana debt to GDP ratio in present value terms was 109% of GDP. This is in present value terms. So if you look at it in nominal terms, it was more than this. Of course, the discount with the IMF uses is 5%. So the marginality may not be that much. So this is where we are. And the IMF says that our debt to GDP ratio in present value terms should be where? 55%. Do you see this gap? Okay, do you see this gap? So the IMF said that they will not learn to us because this is where we be. And this is where we are. So the important question was, how do we close this gap? Now, since 1993, any time we go through those disruptions, we had only one approach. We call it fiscal consolidation. So now... The conclusion was that fiscal consolidation alone at where Ghana had gotten to will not be enough to correct the imbalances. So when they do the fiscal adjustment, it will only bring it from 109 to 81 percent. And we are still not here. And that is why. So when we saw this, we started advising Ghanaians that there will be haircut. And if you are not careful, you may not even choose the style of the haircut. What was it? This is a reality. This is a reality. Okay, so fiscal adjustment, so, if, so this is what it means. So if you have to employ fiscal adjustment alone to bring this line here to here, the level of taxes and expenditure cut the country will have to go to the next three years. We cannot bear it. 
It may even trigger a, reg a regime change. And that is why they have to apportion it across fiscal and then debt restructuring. So fiscal is bringing it from here to 81%. Then the domestic debt restructuring will bring it from 81 to what? 72. And then between 72 and 55 will come from where? External debt what? Restructuring. This is how the burden sharing has been what? Done. And that is why it tells you why the external debt restructuring is so vital. Because we are done with the domestic. Without the external, we will not make progress. So maybe just to conclude and all of that, uh, Dr. Tua Champon has spoken about the, about the financing gap, right? So look at this whole thing. The IMF, with their name on the program, is only giving us $3 billion the next three years. Out of the financing gap of $15 billion in balance of payment terms, we expect part to come from the World Bank and the rest of them, right? But we expect $10.5 billion to come from external debt restructuring. Is that not too much of axing from them? Let's look at the eligible bonds of external debtors at the end of 2022 that is available for restructuring. Of course, China, uh, we are told that uh, one of the parties is asking for the cut-off days to be brought to March 2020. We are looking at the implications of all of this and why that recommendation. The eligible bonds available for restructuring is just $20 billion. It's just $20 billion. Okay? So if out of $20 billion you want relief of 10.5 without considering coupon payment, that translates to principal haircut of almost 50%. So you can understand why the minister is talking about a haircut of between 30 to what, 40. But then if you look at it in combination with coupon reduction and maturity reprofiling, together with the uh, accrued coupon payment from the beginning of this year to now, then you are looking at something probably below 50%, right? But that's, that's a lot to ask from creditors. Please, it's your country I'm talking about. <laughs> Of course, smartly, the IMF and the World Bank, the European Central Bank, the African Development Bank, with their total debt of $8.8 .8 billion, they are saying that their debt is not up for restructuring. Smart. <laughs> okay, so progress of Dr. Tio has spoken about this, but my real concern is this. We're hoping that the, fis the fiscal space that has been created with the domestic debt restructuring will be able to deploy it more in capital spending. But unfortunately, we are using it to reward labor, right? So if you see the jump in, in compensation and the rest of them, you can see that we are going back to our old world self, and that is not good enough. Uh, there are some things that I've, I've skipped that uh, Dr. Ali Nachan who spoke about them, so I can make progress. So in terms of expenditure, um, of course, government is not spending as though we are under austerity, right? So if you see the jump in expenditure, but largely driven by consumption-based spending and the rest of them, uh, tax measures and the rest of them, really, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for my good boss to talk about. Look at re revenue allocation, right? You see compensation for employees, which is uh, 60, approximately 64 billion CDs. Already we are told that uh, base pay has gone about 23%, right? And then there's rumor that, is it rumor so that we'll come back somewhere July for maybe election-related salary adjustment? Probably. Probably. Then, so look at capital expenditure. We're not spending that much here. Okay. Any country that is not allocating sufficiently to CAPEX is actually not preparing for tomorrow. We are running down our infrastructure. We are unable to maintain. We are not expanding our infrastructure stock. In fact, if you look at all the infrastructure ministries in 2024, allocations to them actually didn't go up that much. And the jump in capital expenditure is not enough to compensate us for inflation. So in real terms, really, we are not. So the conclusion of this is that, colleagues, there's a lot we have to do as a country for recovery, for progress, to benefit the ordinary Ghanaian and the rest of them. So please, yes, we've made some progress. We see some relative stability, but there are a lot of grounds that we need to cover. But look at the interesting thing. With the domestic debt exchange and the rest of it, of course, the fiscal space, we, have, we've, we took out, we are using it. But look at the, the growth in the interest payment. 
we have not reflected the external debt component yet, right? But if you look at it up to here, you can see that with the rising interest costs on the domestic treasury bill borrowing, we are actually closing that gap very, very fast. And we need to do a lot more to do that. Part of the recommendation I, I will make, I, I, I lean towards uh, Dr. Chua Champas, I conclude. You know what? The next government should govern with less than 40 ministers. And then let's merge some ministries. Right? We need a drastic what? Measure. So that this table, we need to tilt it more towards CAPEX. Right? Because we need roads. There are no roads. Look, um, I went to Central Region to go and do a presentation for 45 minutes. I spent eight hours in and out. This is not efficient. Look at what people go to Monday morning. People have skewed their faces in the traffic. You, you understand that? The productivity losses, the traffic, the wear and tear to your car. Your car may not be roadworthy. If the road is not car worthy, what do we do? Who do we compensate in all those discussions? So time is not on our side. Remember, remember that as we are here, if you look at what Senegal is doing, if you look at what Côte d'Ivoire is doing, as we move deeper into the implementation of the African continental free trade, let's not think that it's just about us and we can do politics here. Okay, let's look at things in relative terms. Let's also look at things within our regional peers and structural peers and our aspirational peers. Chair, thank you so much. Doc, I think we have to take you around the country because I know you can also speak, you know, like local language and other languages. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Dr. Liach, what's up with your class? <laughs> okay, so maybe come and uh, give us a few uh, thoughts and then, okay. I know it's been valuable 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much. You know, it's good to speak as the third person because if you go to the Court of Appeal, the first judge reads, Second, read the test. I have nothing useful to add. <laughs> so they've said it all for me. All the skipping, he was skipping the taxi, and I will say it, I will say it. But you see, he's my professor. If I don't, he will promote me. So we are saying that if it comes to tax, that is the policy you should use to shape the economy. And the two speakers all mentioned, if you are spending and you can't raise it, then you have a problem. And Tio mentioned it. It's all cyclical. And because we are stakeholders in the space, I've highlighted those you pay attention to, because that is what I was told. Tax policy, we are looking at the taxes that government decides to levy. Not only the taxes, but the amounts involved. And that is what he was mentioning. And at what rates? And on who? Before he came up, he was saying that, look at us, driving our diesel and petrol, we are going to be taxed 100 cities. So we move to electric cars. Then you know where it is going to. So that's what civil society you need to uh, look up to. So we are saying that in the short term, what you can do is to be able to stabilize the economy. And that is what uh, the, the two professors, uh, Bokwin and Tio, were saying, that there don't seem to be any long term and our challenge is that every government has four years. So nobody plans beyond four years. That is one of our biggest problems. And so we think that institutions like the National Development Planning Commission should take charge of such issues. When you are voted into power, come and tell us which of them you can implement within the four years. Not party manifestos being our economic plan. It won't work. Because he has four years. Why should he think beyond four years? He will start thinking, he's not even too sure he can do eight. Else he won't say, I'll break the eight. <laughs> you shouldn't tell us. Go and break it. You don't need to tell us. So what you have to look then is that taxation policies act as a powerful instrument for governments to navigate economic downturns. Like uh, Professor Buckley was saying, if you want to create jobs, you want to create an entrepreneurial class, who are the entrepreneurs? A lot of them are self-employed, one-man businesses. Then you increase the uppermost tax table to 35%. That's the tax you are giving them. 
Because you're giving them exemption three years. After the three years, they are going to face 35%. So why wouldn't I do everything and three years I close down? Somebody came to me, I want to set up a business. And after three years, I close it down. Because the revenue stream will last for three years. He's going to fail trees, timber, and export. And the contract is for three years. So when I finish, I've closed. No work. That is where we may be pushing ourselves to. And then Dr. Tio Champo mentioned that in the situation we are, we find this counter-cyclical taxation policies. And it's not helpful. We will show a table and you see inconsistencies in policies. We have VAT. We split it into flat rate, 3%, 5%. We go back, we withdraw the 3%. Everybody go back to 12 and a half. Then we come back three years. Now we split it again, 3%. We had real estate paying 5% after the previous government. We came, collapsed it, put them on 12 and a half. This budget, we are giving them back to the 5%. So you see what we've done over the seven years? Inconsistency. It's not helpful. Okay? And once you do that, you find out that we decided to abolish uh, VAT on financial services, nuisance tax, is coming back. It started Nicodemusly, like Elevi. And it's not working. Because that was why. And just when the VAT on financial services was picking up, we abolished it. So you can imagine what we've lost. It's just like announcing we will abolish toll boot, then we abolish it. We will abolish you, then we abolish it. Causing financial loss of two months. That money could do something. Now we are going back to toll booth. Do you realize we are going back? So all we were lost at the time we collapsed it was unnecessary. Counter-cyclical. It could fix some potholes. And that is what we are afraid of. And then you realize that when we use measures under COVID, you saw the measures government brought in taxation. Very youthful. All those in the health sector they were giving rebates from their taxes. And even currently, in the 2023 uh, budget, the law was passed. If you can show that you lost your job through COVID or through hardships of the economy, you can access your tier two and then enjoy. My, it's a good policy, but my question has always been, why should I prove I'm suffering? <laughs> Don't you know I'm suffering? I thought that we should rather have made it blanket that all employees can access maybe 30% of their tier two to ease the pressure on themselves. That motivation makes workers exert more effort and then you can grow the economy. That is the good side about using or trying to extend the deadline for filing returns for companies, giving waiver of penalty and interest, very good policies to help businesses to revamp. But the idea then is that civil society, we should be able to determine what was the revenue improvement after the waiver. So if it is not working, we don't repeat it. Otherwise, somebody will always misbehave and be praying for waiver. I know here we pray a lot, like Prof was praying in tongues. Unfortunately, I say Muslims, I can't pray in tongues. Maybe if I recite Arabic and it sounds like tongue, my boss would did you expose me, say this is not tongues. Okay, so that is what we need to do. And we are, that's the penalty interest waiver I talked about. So the idea about civil society is that let's try and see how government is striking the balance. You need revenue, agreed. But how are you also not impoverishing businesses so they can grow? That balance is what we need. If you are granting incentives, like uh, Prof rightly mentioned, against the uh, ban on uh, you, you didn't even list the items, but I'll list my yemwadie. I know people are hungry. <laughs> you know, yemwadie and tuzafi is good. So that was where my interest was. The offers of the animals, you understand. If you think that the idea is to ban certain products, improve on our foreign exchange, enhance domestic production, identify those and let's deal with it. Not that blanket approach of less ban because they've done it in such a way if you want to speak against ah you see they don't want us to create domestic businesses that doesn't work for civil society just look at what and then we are saying that look if you want to design a tax policy in a downturn we are in consider what how is it going to guarantee competitiveness innovation 
investment, prosperity, entrepreneurship. What is there for the person to think outside the box? If not, we'll all be in the salaried jobs, collect our noku fuel, and then, like he rightly said, when you are going to buy the gobe, you don't even ask the amount. Like somebody going to eat and he has no money to buy meat. So when they gave him the fufu, they said, what meat do you want? He said, do you have tiger meat? <laughs> they said, no. How about the meat of a lion? They said, no. He said, then give me okro. <laughs> so it's not as if he didn't want to buy meat, but what the meat he wants, you don't have it. You don't have it. So what's your problem? So that is what we need to look at. And again, the highlighted issue is of concern. Reforms in tax policy should find a balance between fostering equity, achieving budgetary efficiency, and circumventing the distortive effects. And that is what Prof mentioned. He just ended with the, the budget line. And you saw wages and salaries. Look at the expenditure. So after paying wages and salary, paying interest on debts, our money is finished. We have nothing for capital investment, which is the long-term investment that will grow the economy. And so that is what we need to be looking at. When you take the budget, look at the budget lines. How is it efficient? Where is government spending? Like he said, we need roads. Where is the amount going? That is what we need to be looking at. And also the accounting for the various distributional effects. For example, if you take PIAC report and they tell you the oil money was used to build a school in this community, they go on visits and there's no school. But it's been spent. That is where our problem is, accountability for some of the spending. Then Prof and Dr. Tio mentioned the international bid. With globalization, now we have after. How do we capitalize on it? Interestingly, Listening to these policies that have come from customs, they are doing this uh, transit trade, and you are not allowed to do it by route. It should be by ship. I'll tell you here today, from here you can check whether there is any shipping route along the west coast of Africa. You can't send goods from Ghana to Sierra Leone, even to Togo. You can't by ship. No. You put it on Delmas or Scanship, it's going to Denmark or Norway, and they put it on another ship coming to Togo, just your next door neighbor. And you are telling me if I load on track and go, I don't qualify. How is this policy sitting with AFTA? So we we'll sit here and Kenya will come and sell car batteries and make the money from AFTA. Countries will come and sell car ties and then... So when Prof was talking about industrialization, people have soon forgotten we're manufacturing car ties, Bonsa tie factory in Ghana. Today, all the ties, Yokohama, Dunlop, from China, India, Korea, with car ties, even glass. We had Aboso glass factory. Now we import everything. That is where our challenge is. So the idea about international cooperation is also to leverage and get governments to give us information on businesses and how much they are reporting. They earn so much under declare, but in their countries, the systems are such that you can't under declare. So we are signatories to multilateral exchange of information agreement. We should be able to contact the competent authority in those countries. Those are the revenue authorities. They will tell us how much they are reporting as income from Ghana. On the front page of a graphic on a Saturday in 2016, it was boldly written, Switzerland imports $2 billion worth of gold from Ghana. When we followed up at Minerals Commission, the whole 2016, there was no export of gold to Switzerland. There was no record. What went out, the total export was 1.768. And it went to Dubai, India, China. So where is that gold? And who reported it? Because when I mentioned, I was being questioned, where did you get this data? I said, graphic, front page. You were busy attending funeral and weddings. You couldn't even look in the papers, front page. And who said it? The Swiss trade envoy in Ghana. What is Ghana's trade envoy in Switzerland reporting? He's popping champagne on behalf of Ghana. <laughs> what else? This is where our problem is. So with international cooperation, we can tackle the issues of base erosion and profit shifting. That is the BEPS, where businesses transfer their profits 
out of the country by charges from their counterparts and we wouldn't know illicit financial flows we don't eat gold we don't bath gold all the galam say going on where is the gold have we asked we are interested in fighting the environment and nobody is asking the revenue from the gold where is it and if you take small mine mining companies small scale miners they contribute not less than 30 percent of total gold production every year which is bigger than two major mines combined if you take newmont anglo gold combined is not up to the 30 percent so where is the gold then is it difficult to get minerals commission precious minerals marketing company bank of ghana sit down auditor general reconcile for us because you can't export without going through PMMC if you're a small scale miner. If you're a big company, Minerals Commission has the records. All proceeds are to be paid into the Bank of Ghana. Why can't we do that? It's not difficult. So that is what you should look at. And like we are all discussing, the structure of the economy, capacity to administer public service needs, and all those factors determine the kind of tax system you would have, the rate, the amount to be levied, which sector, it depends on this. So no one rate exists anywhere. That is why when Professor Bobkin and Dr. Tio were showing, you could see how some countries are recovering faster because they have different structures than we have and they make sure that the right thing is done. So as we mentioned tax policy, tax policy, we say that it's all about the decision that will be made. Who should be taxed? What should the tax be on? What is the rate? How do we even enforce it? When they started e levy, that was the same challenge I said. What type of tax is it? What structures have you put in place? How do you, now how do you even audit e levy revenue? Who are you going to audit? Is it the aggregators who are by the roadside where you can stand and say transfer for me? Who are you going to audit the person? So you should have involved stakeholders. The telcos could have done the rollout. They are already collecting communication service tax for us. You could have increased communication service tax from 6% to 7%, and they would have brought, that would have covered for the e-levy. And still, it's not performing because we did not go through the right processes, okay? That's what I was saying, extensive consultation. In fact, if you talk to engineer Dr. Ken Nashibwe, he will tell you, telcos got to hear of E-Levy the day the budget was read. So how do they reconfigure their systems to help you? The days of Kwani Kwani budget making is gone. Discuss with us. Discussing with the people does not mean if they reject it, you can't do it. You only put them on notice. If they even disagree, they prepare their systems and be able to line on and assist. But we are all stakeholders in revenue generation. So the times that we can look at progressive taxation in times of crisis, when people appreciate the crisis in aid, you are able to win their attention to be able to pay. When we increase corporate tax, uh, personal income tax 35% upper limit, you didn't hear any complaint. Because people who earn more believe they have to pay more. And then we are saying that in times of crisis, when you increase taxes, people are able to accept it because they all agree that is the way to go. 1% COVID levy. Who complained? Nobody. It's only after people have started COVID. Oh, if COVID is gone, let's remove it. COVID is not gone. It has subsided. And again, if you look at the law, it said to meet COVID expenditure and related matters. And so when I tell people we don't need to remove that levy, if it was the name given to it that is making us think that way, let's change our thinking. Otherwise, if it's removed, you will see what will come. With the problem in Kolebu, we would have asked for dialysis levy. Akosombo down spillage, Akosombo down spillage levy. Otherwise, you ask for levy on every other occurrence. That is not taxation. That is not tax policy. Which is why I was asking, why couldn't we have increased the national health insurance levy and use the increase to meet the COVID instead of bringing a new handle? That has been our...
problem. Then we can always be using consumption-based taxes because everybody consumes a good or a service at a point in time. And that is why you see that government increased VAT from 12.5% to 15%. That is how they were trying to resolve issues because with the indirect tax, it's easy to administer and collect. Then there is wealth taxation. A lot of people above certain threshold are under the high net worth individual unit. I'm there as well. Is that a high net worth individual? Nagrat. Uh -huh, Nagrat. High net worth individual. So if I look at myself, then the kind of people should be there and are not there. I'm surprised. People are now getting letters. Where with the international cooperation I'm talking about, people are getting letters. With the GRA stating not only their account numbers, but the amounts in the accounts. In UK, Isle of Man, Genzi, and they slam 30%, come and pay. Else show costs. That's the issue that is happening right now. But we need to zero down. Now, what are the challenges and considerations for all the discussions we are doing in trying to resolve the revenue mobilization in this country? Political and social acceptance. Taxation is very difficult because everybody says, don't tax me, tax that man. You go there, don't tax me, tax that man. And why do we need the political will? If they are able to comply with the tax law, they can then advise and educate their followers. We've all been following primaries going on, and we see the videos of money being shared. Has tax, we are not bothered if you are sharing money, but have you disclosed it for tax purposes and paid the tax? You can do whatever you want with the rest. That is where our problem is. So you can read special prosecutor has invited certain people for questioning. And it's on both sides. Everybody is doing it. Where from there? The money. So if they are able to meet the law, then others will follow. Then we are saying that in trying to use tax policy to change the system, be mindful of what we call unintended consequences. You may end up discouraging investment with your high taxes, which is why we need the balance. And so we say that tax policy makers should always look at it. We've talked about the global coordination because the world is now a global village. We can contact competent jurisdictions and they would also share the information. And we should stop that tax competition, which is what we hear when the ministers they've got the best deal for lithium. Tax competition. Oh, look at the other countries. What is the maximum they are getting? But you too, you can't get maximum of your maximum. Now that's what we say, but. Uh, so we have to look at the link between investment policy, I mentioned that with competition, employment, like we indicated. If you want to get more labor to come in, which is the, what the government has done. In fact, if you employ fresh graduates, depending on their percentage in your workforce, you can get a tax rebate of the amount you are paying because you get additional deductions to make. It's in the law. And the good thing is that the fresh graduate has been defined to include brand new second hand. You know brand new second hand graduate? You were working before you went to university. When you graduate, you are brand new second hand because that's your first work after university. You also qualify. Then we talked about science, technology, innovation when I talked about the rebate for entrepreneurs. They have three years tax holiday if you are 35 and below and you are an entrepreneur, you can enjoy that exemption. Then we are talking about environmental policy. You see where we got all the Bola tax coming from because government is trying to target the environment. And then we are saying for tax administration, we need to safeguard it against corruption. Anytime we say we hear corruption, at Ghana they say it's a perception. But again, we say there's no smoke without fire. If it's a perception, Shraj and Ghana Integrity Initiative will not have come up with their finding that on average we lose $3 billion every year from corruption. $3 billion every year. And then you add to ASAP report of the $2 billion we lose every year from mining. You have got $5 billion. You are in IMF for $3 billion for three years. So $1 billion a year. As against five billion a year. You see, that, that doesn't make sense. So deal with corruption, deal with illicit flows, and you are free. How difficult is that? And if you want to see 
the, the, what the three billion from corruption can do. I'll tell you, find out how much was spent on rich hospital. And you see that this three billion can build 12 rich hospitals. Would that not save us more if the government can channel that money for the Agenda 111? We don't need money to build Agenda 111. It's here. If we can save ourselves from corruption, we have enough. That is where you see the seriousness of such policies. So the way forward, we don't do lamentation. I think we have a book of lamentations. We won't lament. We'll come with solutions. So what is the way forward? Targeted tax and subsidy measures. If you want to focus on economic recovery, look at the areas where you either reduce taxes or increase. Like I keep telling people, all this issue about lithium and as for the rates and the, is it a better deal for me? Natural resources are not in themselves the solution. We've had gold, diamond, bauxite, manganese, timber. Where are they? Is it lithium that will save us? The point is that if lithium is going to use, be used for batteries and we have a policy to have electric cars and they will need that battery, how are we getting companies to establish to produce that battery? That is where we should be looking at. Look at oil. How many of us know that fertilizer is a byproduct of the oil sector? Yet we are importing fertilizer for farmers and we are having problems. Bitumen, byproduct of oil industry. Yet we have year of roads looking for loads to build roads. And we have all the quarries in this country. They are producing. So with your bitumen, you should fix the, every road in Ghana should be tarred by now. That's what our challenge is. Avoid the use of generous profit tax base incentive. So we have the tax exemptions law as CSOs. Are we monitoring? Because still, some exemptions are moving about. We are talking about weighing advantages and disadvantages between the differentiated tax on capital and labor. Because if everybody is going capital, you know the unemployment you will create. Because you are not training the labor to manage the automated devices. What happens? Okay. Then we say we should diversify the tax mix. We seem to be concentrating in only one area. Natural resources, let's tax them. Let's take everything from them. When they collapse, there will be nothing left. How are we looking at other sectors? Strengthen and design progress feature of personal income tax. And then in the VAT, you see, what I like about the GRA is the continuous inspection and visits they are doing. You read about the Chinese cement factory. Look at how much he is owing. And how many of such businesses have taken the VAT but have not remitted. That's a serious offense. You are selling an item for 100. Add VAT of 15 and bring it to me. You've sold it 120. So your profit is in there. Bring me my 15, you are keeping it. You are stealing. Your charges should not be. Then we are saying we should reinforce efforts to broaden the tax. Now we keep talking about the informal sector is between 70 to 80% of the economy. What is their contribution to revenue? Because they are hard to tax, we've abandoned them. But they are making money. You will see them go to food runs, you see the cars, they will come and park and the cloth, they will come down and say, hey. Meanwhile, sitting at Abusuka, sitting at Malata Market, sitting, that is where the money is. What is their contribution? We are saying that if we simplify our tax and tell them, just momo 10 CDs, 20 CDs a week or every two weeks as payment of your tax, we will get there. When we needed money for National Cathedral, didn't we launch Yibima? We launched Yibima with a code. Anybody who can contribute small, bring it. We are not doing Yibima for the nation. Chine keme. Then the most important thing, regular and systematic tax expenditure report. Tax expenditures are the losses in revenue occasioned by exemption reliefs we've given. Are we calculating how much we spent? in those incentives we've given. Because I know that whatever we have, we are between 1.5% to 1.8% of 
the tax expenditure GDP ratio. If we add it to the 13.5 tax revenue, we are going. We add the corruption and we will be in the 20% where we should be as a middle income country. So yes, we are where we are, but we are not working on it. We calculated this for the 15 ECOWAS countries. And ECOWAS came out with a directive in July. That one we've gone to sign. We've gone to sign it, but whether we implement it. I was in Liberia to help them calculate for two years. And since then, they've been doing it. It's not difficult to know. It helps you to know whether you should continue giving some incentives or move it to another angle. That is the guidance in times of crisis. Then lastly, the tax administration, they need to be transparent. If you have a very good tax law and you can administer it, it's zero work. Have a sound policy, you can administer it, zero work. And so that is why we think that tax administration, they should look at their functions, compliance assessment, and risk management. I keep saying, if there is one taxpayer who has been audited more than three times within five years, then I know you don't have a risk management system in the revenue. Because you should be rotating on all taxpayers. So one person, it means it has become your cash cow. Okay? But if it comes to tax services and filing and payment of tax, I think the revenue has done well. They have automated. We can file returns online, pay our taxes in the bank, and then they would link us up. So the way forward, we should strengthen the tax administration, and then we should ensure also to improve certainty. Taxpayers must know what faces them, but not to wake up and there is a tax. How do you plan? Because if you want long term, you have three years for short term, three to five years, medium, beyond five years, long term. But if you keep changing my tax rates within the period, I can't plan. I'll be waiting for you. So instead of being a leader, when we say private sector is the engine of growth, they tend to be followers. And that is where we have a problem. So when they follow, before they can settle, you've changed again. That is where we are and we need to. We should develop and safeguard the independence of tax administration and then also the filing of returns which we have been able to improve. We've talked about the international cooperation already. And so what you need to do is to let us have, um, imp we, we've talked about this already. Can we have the table on the taxes? to conclude so we see where we are. So this has all been covered. Want to show you the taxes that have come on board since 2020. We've left out even the backlog. Else you will realize that when government came, they abolished 16 tax types. You see what has come is more than 16. And then you wonder that were they really nuisance taxes? Couldn't we have managed them? Well, my provision was that Granted, they are nuisance taxes. Why don't you abolish two every year on a ranking of which is more of a nuisance? Then at the time COVID hit, you could have adjusted and be able to keep some revenue lines coming in. So here you are. We have the um, national fiscal. Go up. Okay. Go up. So this one you control for me. Yes, national fiscal stabilization levy was 5%. And then it was amended. You know, it was there. It started in 2009. It was for, to be for two years. Every two years, they review, renew, renew. It has become permanent. Like what we had, Provisional National Defense Council. Later became Permanent National Defense Council. Then there was an increase in the tax-free band, 319. But that one, we all know, anytime we agree on the basic minimum wage, that would go up. So that's a positive. Then personal income tax reliefs were also increased in 2019 from 600 to 2,000, depending on the category. If you are married, you get marriage relief, 1,000 to You take care of aged dependents, 1,000 per aged dependent. I was telling people, 1,000 to does not mean rush and marry. 1,000 to is for the whole year. <laughs> so it can me chop money, but at least. Then we had COVID-19 health recovery levy in 2021, 1%. Financial sector recovery levy, 5%. So you can see the pressure on financial sector. They will pay financial sector recovery levy, pay sustainability levy, and these are all not cost and they are not deductible. 
Income tax amendment, they brought rebate for self-employed commercial vehicles, energy sector levy. And you see, this is one levy that was bringing us so much money would have been paying the independent power producer. And we reduced it. For no reason. And now we are trying to jump it up again. Growth and sustainability levy 2023 has come to replace National Fiscal Stabilization Levy. So I don't know whether it is a renaming, whether it has converted from being a Muslim to a Christian. So they changed from National Fiscal, like they gave him my boss's name. Uh, excise duty, 20% on cigarette, e-smoking devices, sweetened beverages, spirits, and wine. Good policy, but I keep asking, if your idea is for a health recovery, that these cause sicknesses that reduce your health recovery levy, then I don't think increasing the rate is the health. Because when I'm used to it, Prof will tell you, if my elasticity of demand is, is good, inelastic, I'll keep consuming and be paying. And your health bill will keep deteriorating. So if you wanted to target, say, sweetened beverages, why couldn't we have the scale? If the sugar content in your drink is 5%, you pay 10%. If it's 20%, you pay. Then they would rather address the sugar content to solve your health problem. But if it is for revenue, fine. But then it means that the policy, then withholding tax has been brought in 2023, 3% for residents, 10% for non residents If you realize your asset or a liability, you pay. They, gave, they increased the benefit for... Uh, if you have a car, a company provides you with vehicle accommodation. They've given reliefs that you should enjoy. Then they brought in winning tax on uh, lottery betting, 10%. Which they are shouting everywhere. Uh, it's good, though. <laughs> it's good, though, to our purpose. To bring us revenue. It will sanitize the system. And then, if you say it's not good, it's not good, then you are either not in the church or in the mock, so. <laughs> yeah, the man, aha, that is uh, the area of my boss, tax governance. That's what you're asking for. Then the increase in VAT from uh, 12 and a half, and then the penalty waiver, which we discussed, was good enough to be able to reduce the pressure on businesses. So, this is what we'll share with you. The slides will be made available, and when you have questions, I'm sure Doc is here to deal with it. We have two dogs here, and so you don't have a problem. Two dogs equals a professor. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. So, so this is it's, it's not to make you feel a sense of despair, because I mean it, these are very serious matters, and and there's a lot of work to do. But I think for Citizen Coalition, we keep reminding ourselves that you know citizens have power. And we don't want to feel like we, we are disabled. We, don't, we just don't have any agency. So it is to let labor what the situation is and ourselves, how can we mobilize ourselves to make sure that we can secure for ourselves a society and a nation that benefits us. Because as for the politicians, they will, they will come and go time. So if it was left to their own designs. They'll do what benefits them and they'll leave. What about us? So that's what we have to focus on. So uh, we've talked a lot, uh, but you are here not just to come and look at all of us and uh, listen. We also just want to also hear your thoughts. If you have questions uh, and you know, get clarifications from um, our experts who are always rare to get. So. Uh, use them now before they go. So I'll open open the the floor for 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 questions, comments. Try and keep it short, snappy. Um, Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Please, your name and uh, uh, my name is Samuel Agri, uh, General Secretary for the Food and Beverage Association of Ghana. Now, um, I have 
two contributions and two questions. You now try to keep it quick and short for us. Very Thank well. You. The sweet tax, as we see, the uh, presenter said, we have so many issues within the food and beverage sector. We said, with the taxes that has been imposed over a period, saying that because we are consuming too much sugar, the question is, are we not supposed to have a committee or a discussion on this issue? Because, like he said, with the sugar that we put in our content, it rises from either 10% down to 0%. So 0%, you pay less tax. Graduating, this is how much you're going to pay up to that 10%. But unfortunately, we are taxing it as uh, excise duty. We are using the money for consumption instead of going into the health sector to do. What if we raise the NHIA? Say that we are using it so that anything that will come in that area, this is how we are going to solve it. So therefore, people who come with other health challenges can also benefit from this money. We look at it on the other side, where the NHIL cost is 2.5%, which is very low. And even um, paying for uh, your yearly contribution that you pay, which is even around uh, three percent, uh, uh, three cities for the children and 45 maximum for the adults. It doesn't go to help the situation that we are trying to address. So therefore, the collecting money on taxes and consuming it, we need to look at it very well. It takes transparency and uh, the will to do it. Now, the second question, is also, or the second contribution has to do with the, the electric cars that the government said we are bringing on board. The question is, do we have the infrastructure to deal with this situation? No. If it's a long-term issue that we are looking at, then we should say in future, this is the way we are going to go. The other thing is that we have more cars polluting our environment. So how do we remove them? This is the issue where we should have a practical issue by saying that all the cars that we bring into this country, perhaps uh, we can table a period that between 2015 down to 2023, the cars that are coming in, maybe will be less duty or less duty free. Once you bring in, you submit your old cars for destruction. This way then we have a, a practical issue in dealing with the situation as we have now. Unfortunately, that is not it. But we are asking that we are going to bring electric cars just to give some job to somebody whose business it is. So we need to look at that, that one again. Then we'll look at the after. Time and time again, we have said this program, if we are not careful, Ghana will not benefit as it is because our industrial sector it's not one that you can call home about. We have a, a country that we are growing at negative 1% in our industrial sector. And how can we improve that situation? So if you look at the other countries where they are properly situated and continually increasing or uh, forming, formulating policies that will improve their uh, industrial sector, and we don't see that to happen. That is how it comes to my last question with the ally that was placed before the, uh, uh, the parliament. If you look at it, government said we want to save money to pay our debts. And therefore, certain things that we eat shouldn't come into the country. But then you ask yourself, if the cost of food is even high, well, we have a tenure of six months to eight months before our rice becomes mature, matured, then it comes into the market. What do we do? as a country. We have said time and time and again that what we need to do is to improve the silo system that we have in this country so that the rice that we grow in this country, for the next two years, we should keep them in our barns and the silos where we can then release them to solve a problem. But as it is now, our consumption is about 1.8 million metric tons 
official and unofficial sources. And the production in this country is about 900,000 metric tons of paddy rice, where when it's processed, we have almost about 600 milled rice. And you are asking that 600,000 should give way to the 1.8 million metric tons of milled rice. So there's a big problem in whoever uh, try to submit this to parliament for us to look at it. And all the things that were listed, if you look at it, it doesn't really help. So we said, in that bill, what is it there to help grow industry? We should bring it about because not too long ago, we heard, they said, uh, benchmark value must go up. And the proponents of it were, the answer was, we are going to do that so that the local sector will grow. Can we get any percentage? that between the time that this thing was presented, uh, uh, presented for us to, to use and the time now, how has the industry grown? It's zero percent. We have not had any increment. The money has been collected into consumption. So when we have this problem at hand and government is not seen to be transparent in that area, then we have a, a, a very big issue. I like the way the presenters has been very transparent transparent in presenting the, 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 the issue that we have in this country. So if the solutions must be there, then we need to tackle that one with the same transparency. And if we do that, be it uh, whatever political party is in power, the technocrat has preferred so many solutions, but we don't use them. So we should go back and look at it. If we really want to grow this country, then we should have a target as to how we want Ghana to be in the next five years. All the solutions are here. We can still find them. Thank you. I want to take uh, two more questions, uh, if you see any clarity. Our students, did you get? Yeah. <laughs> Or, or maybe it's connecting it to your student loan and other things that uh -huh, are bothering you in school, right? Uh, so maybe some of those connections. But but if it just, I think, the, the, the point that Mr. Agri has, has put on the table. So the, the, the issue then for me also is that you represent a very important group. You do have the resources to also generate your own data that you are getting on the ground. I mean, how are you pushing, you know, that data out to challenge policy objectives? And, you know, because the point that was raised by Professor Bob in the video is that at what point do we say, okay, what we have decided is not working? And therefore, we have to look at it. How do we get that information to, say, Parliament? How do we get it to other decision makers to challenge? Because it looks like we will complain in this forum but how do we take that process forward to make sure that the policy objective that government is committed to is actually being you know, fulfilled? So I think there's more conversations to be had about from us as the civil society, what kind of general, uh, data are we generating to challenge or contest or affirm whatever we think is happening uh, in terms of policy? Because if we just complain about it, it's not going to change. So we're going into an election year. If we think that some of these policies that you have, you know, you've talked about, for instance, it's not meeting the objective, then we have to challenge it, you know, and and get a discussion that forces government to explain to us why we should continue to have these policies going on. Because sometimes, when I think about taxation, I'm asking, so I can't go to court and say that as for this taxation. It, it, it's, yeah, it, it, <laughs> why should, you know, because government wants to uh, impose a tax, I should, I should accept it. I don't know how it works legally. I was going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Lee Achia, you know, whether I can go to court and, and challenge that some of this taxation doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, the court should, should order for it to be taken off. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's where we need to take our advocacy to the next stage. Um, um, let me get your, your, your final thoughts because I know you have to go. Um, and then just we'll invite uh, Chitam 
just to show, you know, we, you talked about, you've always challenged us to try and see if we can cost governance. You know, how much does it cost for government to exist? Yeah. Right? We've, <laughs> we attempted it and it was not that easy, but I think we really need to pursue that so that we can talk substantively about expenditure and revenue. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we are trying to attempt to really track some of these processes. So let me get your, your final thoughts before you go. Um, and then uh, Chitam, just come and talk about method. I just want you to show uh, uh, our colleagues here what we are tracking. We don't need to go, this is still work in progress, but what we are looking at so that we can grow and expand it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think that um, what we have presented here is verifiable. So it's not a creation, okay? So, and it's our country. So you can, you can also follow. The point is that if the citizens are a bit more armed with the right information, right data, we can ask the relevant questions, right? Because quite a large number of Ghanaians seem not to know exactly what is going on. Okay? And therefore, we tend to believe the, polit the political narrative and sometimes, depending on which radio station you are listening to, inflation is high. If you are listening to another radio, inflation is low. Meanwhile, it's the same inflation and the rest of them. So, and I think the comment that you made from the business associations, I think we need to work together, right? Because some of the work that we do is very costly getting the data. And because of that, we are not really tracking and doing analysis as a feedback. And I can tell you that the politicians, sometimes when you confront them with the data, with the analysis, that this is not working, they, they will listen. They will listen. So let's work together. And I believe that let's keep the conversation going on. The idea is not to promote a regime change. I hope that's OK. But we all wish that if it goes well, it's good for all of us, right? And, and it will benefit all of us also. So, but in conclusion, let's have a long-term view to life. Right. You will be disappointed to think that somebody is coming to change this drastically the next two years or so. Right? The kind of transformation, inclusive productivity growth we are looking for, it will take a while. But consistency. What has eluded Ghana over the years is that sometimes we do the right thing in between. But how do we do the right things consistently? Right? So that whether there is an election or not, in terms of a certain path that we are on, we should not derail that. Okay, that is very, very important. So thank you very much. I'm a teacher on a government payroll. So, uh, if you can. Thank you very much. Uh, please, a clap for <laughs> Professor Bob King. Yeah, if you can project the the tracker, this tracker that we, we have been pulling our hair around trying to uh, work on. It's just to show you what we are working on, but, um, and, and I think as we go along, this will be useful because there has also been some good ideas about tracking like expenditure on uh, uh, tax, uh, um, um, uh, what's it called, the, the CIT, the, um, yeah, tax expenditure and, and all of that. I think just to give people data, because if, you, if you're able to do it in time, then you can raise the concern and then... Okay. We are, uh, how much progress we are making at each point. You understand? So all the information that they have shared with us here, it will be on, on an interactive platform that you can go in there and look for any information that you want. How did Ghana perform, let's say, by the first quarter under the IMF program? Uh, how is our debt figure now? 
since we signed up to the program and the revenue performance, uh, the benchmark that were set out, uh, structural reforms, how we are doing and all that. Then there is another one also coming up, purely dedicated to debt. Because as you heard from the beginning, the crisis we are facing now is debt-induced. So we are looking at how do we get ourselves from here. Because most people don't even have a true appreciation of the, the nature of the situation, the, the nature of the debt that we owe domestically, externally. If it's external, what types? Bilateral, multilateral, is it commercial or what? All those ones. Then the last one, how do we build an economy beyond IMF bailouts? Because from what we have been told, for 18 times since our independence, we seem, we spoil everything, then we go to IMF, we stabilize, it seems it's building up, then we will, we have been to the north, combining the five regions, we've been to Ashanti region, combining the central, uh, with the middle belt, and um, early January, God willing, we are going, uh, we'll be doing the southern one in Takradi, bringing uh, no, um, western north and central region together. Then we'll do the national, bringing everyone together. So keep your ears open. Um, those of you on social media, on X, every two weeks, we have a Northern, follow Northern report. Hmm? We have this Twitter space that we, we hold always on economic issues like this. And we bring experts like um, we have the professors here and many others. And they break down some of the issues for us to understand them better. We, ask, we get opportunity to ask questions. So if you are on this, uh, you are on X, look for economic governance platform. And we are doing some of these by the kind courtesy of um, Oxfam, uh, here represented by uh, Mr. Uh, Mohammed um, Anwar Sadat, who, who is uh, uh, what, the acting country director. So a round of applause for, for the support that we are receiving from them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, know, you can take it over. Uh, um, so, so the experts have said everything. However, for Citizens Coalition, we try to track some commitments that have been made in the 2023 budget and the IMF agreement, considering the fact that most often these our politicians and our statements come out, and we have a lot of commitments that are made, and not all of them are seen through to the full extent, and some also are not even seen through at all. So we had three broad components, eight subcomponents, and 10 commitments from the IMF agreement in the 2023 budget. So the three broad component, components were the public financial management, anti-corruption, and state-owned enterprises. We had 24 assessment trackers that we used, and we used a rating of yes, not yet rated, and no. These are very simple trackers that we got from the commitments. We didn't want to put any performance. We are only just tracking the commitment that they said, I'm going to do this, so I've done it. I'm going to do this by this time. Has it been done by that time, yes or no? So those, and we got those information from the IMF agreement, some from the 2023 media budget review, some from the IMF official publications, the 2024 budget volume one, which was just published, and then some government websites and media presses. So these are some key findings that we got for this particular RTD that we are having. So we are gonna go through for public financial management, which is findings on GiveMIS. GiveMIS is the government integrated financial management system. So this is, so for the first tracker, as you can see, we have deployment of GIFMIS to all IGF reliance institutions, and this is no. Our evidence is from the 2024 budget, which says, Mr. Speaker, government has taken steps to address the challenge of weaknesses in expenditure controls arising from statutory funds and IGF reliance institutions. So this statement just implies that they have not done that. The next one was to the integration of all sources of funds to GIFMIS, and then still no. We have no available data on that. The third is to the completion and rollout of GIFMIS to, of the GIFMIS infrastructure with all available functionalities. Currently, some functionalities are available to the MDAs and all and the IGF reliance institutions that have been deployed to. So we said no for that. 
because to this end, this is a statement that they made in the 2024 budget that to this end, government has fast-tracked. We, we still do not know to what extent that they have put all the available functionalities. We don't even know how many available functionalities that there are. So we said no for that. And the fourth one was enlisting of, of all public universities on the IPPD2 payroll. The IPPD2 payroll is the system that they use to pay the teachers and the government staff in the universities. And it says, Mr. Speaker, the ministry enrolled 65 public tertiary institutions onto the GiveMiss platform to undertake all financial transactions. Now, the IPPD2 payroll is supposed to be on the GiveMiss platform. However, for this one, we do not know how many public universities are supposed to be listed on there because online we have evidence that says that there are just about 19 public universities, but here they say they have 65 published. Next. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop you there. Um, so the, 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 I mean, if you know how important gift miss is, it's really your control. So if you are Ministry of Finance, once budgets are approved, the estimates are approved, all the details, all the things. What is gift mix? <laughs> you, 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 no, no, no. It's Ghana uh, information, uh, uh, integrated uh, financial management information system. Yeah. Right? Usually you will find it, this one, if miss, because we are Ghana, we have yeah, yeah, sure. our G2. Yeah. So it's an integrated uh, financial uh, management information yes. system. Yeah. And it's a system that has been deployed mm. to check, control government um, expenditure. Yes. So that if in the budget an expenditure is approved, it has to be logged into the system. So that any expenditure that you are making, if it does not correspond with what is in the system already, it will not allow you to, uh, to spend. It is supposed to prevent off-budget spending the way we see it a lot of money is spent outside the budget and that is why we see the overruns the cost overruns that we see the excess uh, spending that we so it is a tool that is supposed to uh, curtail excessive spending unfortunately it has taken us years to enroll all government um, ministries departments and agencies and so this is very very important as could you was saying yeah about systems and so we make this commitment that we, okay we want to control our expenditure so we'll make sure that we have all give me functionalities everything make sure everybody's on give me your budget is there if you say that you're employing three people is there if you say you're making this procurement is there we can track it so if we get it right then you know we'll be on our way but every time the finance minister comes, he says, what, how many, is this as much as 70% of transactions are not linked to gift, gift mix? And then you ask yourself, but what is parliament doing? Because parliament should be able to say, if you do not do gift mix integration, I am not approving your budget. So how we hold accountable the value chain for PFM systems are going to be very, very important. And that's why we have to track this and push it and advocate, you know, that it's done. Uh, there are, we, they've committed to enact the code of conduct for public office holders. If you don't know what it is, so this is legislation that would deal with public ethics. You remember when that scandal about uh, cash for, what's it called? <laughs> cash for seats, right? So if you are going, you want to sit with the president, it's 10,000. If you want to sit next to the minister's table, it's 5,000. Now, you don't have any law that says that that will be illegal, right? So you need these kinds of things that deal with self-dealing. It deals with asset declaration. It deals with conflict of interest. This is what that legislation, this is one big part of our uh, uh, anti-corruption legislation that we need to address. Government is committed to pass that legislation, and that's why one of the things we have to also push. And then they also said that they were going to the IMF, work with the IMF to complete uh, a governance and corruption diagnostics assessment. So we want to know what exactly have they found, right? This is government committing itself so that we can all work together to deal with the problem. I know the IMF has concluded the issue, but what we should push for in trying to keep the system honest. 
But I, I want to use the opportunity basically to uh, close uh, because I think uh, it's, it's uh, past five and we've been uh, spending some time engaging. Um, we're going to try and do some more of this uh, in the coming year because, as I said, we have a big, tall task of trying to hold our politicians in check as they go around promising and uh, trying to spend, you know, and, and put us all in a very bad, bad place in 2025. So uh, we'll continue to engage, call on you. Uh, so watch out for, for information as we go along. Oh, 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 Theo, I, I didn't know you were still online. I, I thought that you were, you were making your money, so. Uh, <laughs> but, please, but please, I would, I would definitely love, love to, to have, have your final, final thoughts, 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 thoughts uh, before, uh, before we, we, go. we go. Oh, no, no, I've been following the conversation. It's great, and it's, it's good to see <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ali <laughs> and uh, Prof, you know, provide the, the further and better particulars to a number of the points that I, I highlighted. I think the key point for me is that we all have a big role to play when it comes to accountability and, and the demand for, for it. Uh, if we leave our politicians uh, as is, I, I worry for the future of this country and for the students that are there and those of us in the, you know, learned professions and middle class, et cetera, you know, we have a voice, we have agency. And it's time we collectively come together to actually push and drive for some of the reforms. Um, the devil always is in the details and let's not fall for some of the high level political slogans and programs and interventions that, that we hear. And I worry that going into next year, there is even going to be more of such, you know, things coming. But luckily we're all here and we have an avenue to interrogate some of these issues and I would encourage, yeah, CDD, the other CSOs and the group, let's have one voice, let's push for more of these platforms and educate the, the public um, for the broader interest and the collective good of, of the country. And that's really what I, I want to end up with, that we need more and we have to push and demand for that accountability because it's not going to come to us on a silver platter, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. much. I think, I think the, the last point is that, you know, whether you are NDC, PPP, or if you are Donko or whatever, when there's debt exchange, they don't exclude the MPP people from the debt exchange. When they're food inflation, when you go to the market, they don't say, are you MPP or NDC? You get it for 20 cities and you get it for 40 cities. So I think it doesn't matter whether you support a party. You still should be concerned and interested in making sure that that party is accountable because that is going to impact on your welfare and your well-being. Right? And that is what I think we have to commit ourselves to. Make sure it doesn't matter what government comes in. If they do right by us, we, 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 we don't really care. Right, so I think this is what we have to fight for. This is what we have to fight for and uh, invest our time. So let me thank you all for, for coming and joining us. Thank you to the UNDP uh, for your continuous support. Uh, to Oxfam uh, for the work you're doing on the economic literacy in particular. And I think there's more to be done at the universities. You know, I, I was really sad when I couldn't find platforms where people were talking about the IMF program. So we have to find a way to engineer some more conversations there, right? And break it down for everybody to understand. So any housekeeping? Yes. And a uh, reminder about uh, Akutuan Pao's celebration of life at the National Theater, 6 p.m. on Wednesday.